Okay, call to order, Board of Education, special session, July 9th, 2020, 5 o'clock. Lisa, you take attendance. Um, all board members are present except for Mark, who I believe will be joining us shortly. Correct. Um, public comment? Yes, and here it is. Okay, we have two public comments. One is from... Yep, one is from Megan from East Dover Elementary School. Good evening, thank you for taking the time to read my concerns. All of my concerns have to do with the safety of myself as a teacher, for my students and for my family at home. I wonder, how can I conference or meet small groups while staying six feet apart? Huge part of teaching is making connections and making students feel our love and support. How can we effectively do that when we are constantly telling them not to get close to us or their peers? How can we real, real, realistically keep four or five, six, four or five or six year olds in kindergarten six feet apart from each other? How will we sanitize and clean shared bathrooms after each use? How am I supposed to stay protected when my students are not expected to wear a mask at all times? How will we be assisted in monitoring the social emotional well being of students in a classroom that could be scary to many little ones, unfamiliar masks, and we can't be too close to friends and teachers? How will sick days be handled? I have to quarantine for two weeks due to a student or staff member being sick. Many staff have their sick days for maternity leave. We will have to give those up for mandatory quarantine. How will you prioritize safety of pregnant staff and immune comp compromised staff and students? How will we supply individual supplies for all students so they do not share supplies? How will we store them if our room or current furniture do not have space for that? Will there be extra custodial staff to help with sanitizing or is it the responsibility of the teacher? The custodial service now is keeping us up to the standard cleaning procedures during the regular year. How will they be held accountable for this important and critical place of returning to school? If specials are, push, are pushing in, how am I really, realistically able to get any prep work done? Who will provide clear masks for staff and students? We have DHHS, DHH students and staff members that rely on facial expression. If a staff member is hospitalized, how will the medical bill be handled? Are we expected to cover it or will the district be responsible? This is just to name a few concerns. I'm truly, I am truly terrified to return to work. I have contemplated all of my options, but if we are forced to return to work, I honestly don't know if I can. It is unrealistic, unrealistic to expect lower elementary students to safely stay apart and not spread germs. My, many families and teachers share these concerns as well. For the mental and physical well-being of everyone, shouldn't we be focusing on creating the most effective online learning platform instead of planning for unrealistic and unsafe in-person return to school? You can move that up. We have another one from Lindsay Taco and other special teachers. Where is the teacher's health and safety language in the return to school conversation? Everything I read is related to the students, which of course are a priority but we are missing a vital piece to the puzzle, the staff that need to be in the building all day. Will we have to use sick days if we are exposed? I'm seriously concerned because in front of 500 children all week, because I am in front of 500 children all week long. What if my spouse or children are exposed and or get sick and I have to quarantine for 14 days? Will those be forgiven or will they take them out of my sick days? It was difficult getting subs before if someone has to be out for 14 days or more, and how will the district handle the sub shortage? Most of the subs I have encountered are way at way are in a high risk capacity due to age, and I would be very surprised if they return this year. What steps will be in place to protect the staff? How can how can we be sure our buildings will be thoroughly cleaned and sanitized when the random night crews were barely just emptying our trash before COVID? What about teachers' mental and emotional health? I see language about kids getting more SEL which they needed pre-COVID, so I totally support that. But how will we support our teachers when they need mental health support? In my very honest opinion, I think we are focusing on building a very strong online program and not rushing back to school. Trying to enforce all these and constantly policing kids all day is going to take a mental toll on our staff in a matter of weeks. How will learning commence in this environment? How will we support the trauma that the kids will endure when we only have school psychologists and social workers part-time? I'm also concerned that we're collecting data from surveys that do not. Uh, uh, I'm also concerned that we're collecting data from surveys that do not include answers to these questions, 
order to provide staff and parents with enough information to make informed decisions. Do I want to send my child to school five days a week or two? Of course, but not if it means 25 kids in a class, masks not worn, special teachers possibly traveling to other buildings and to each classrooms. Are classroom teachers aware of how many students and adult specials teachers are exposed through multiple buildings before coming into the classroom to teach? The general education classroom is not designed to provide quality special lessons. We need to know what the plans look like before we can ask people which plan they would prefer. Do we want to teach PE, art, music, media, Spanish from our, uh, from our kitchens? Absolutely not. But I'm very concerned that we still have many questions that answers, then answers, and that is very scary as a traveling special teacher with asthma and a parent. I can only speak directly for myself I can only speak directly for myself and the others who have signed below. However, I think it is fair to say that these concerns are true for many of my colleagues and families across the district, and I'm willing to be that voice. Would board members and administration be willing to do a full day or week dry run, start to finish, bus to bus stop, follow all the guidelines being set up to see how it looks in person or just not on paper? If, can't read that, are having meetings virtually to plan for in-person learnings, then they are ready for in-person learning. Thank you for your time and consideration in this matter. Lindsay Taco, phys physical education teacher, Wayne BHMS. Mallory Molner, Wayne Lone Pine art teacher. Ann Musin, Eastover art teacher. Taylor Tullefield, Eastover phys physical education teacher. Jane Wolak, Eastover Spanish teacher. Kate Phillip, Eastover music teacher. Cindy Livington, Eastover media specialist. Is that it, Dave? It is. Okay. Thank you for that for the um, for the public comment. Someone will be getting back to the people involved um, after this meeting. With that, um, I have a, a special introduction. Um, we wanted to introduce our student interns and student advisory council. So if before they introduce themselves, can someone put up the slide? And I'll just go through the process. So before these um, students introduced themselves, I just wanted to go through what the process was. And it was a detailed process and a very competitive process this year. So there was an application process along with the application that each of the students who applied, they had to put together a personal statement. Once the students passed through that round, uh, we, uh, the um, students had to present a one minute video based on a spontaneous questions, which they had an hour to prepare for and send back a video um, answering the question. After that process, then three, um, then myself and two of my colleagues along with our superintendent interviewed um, all the um, final candidates. And then from there, we selected our two board interns, as you see on the slide, and our board student advisory council. So with that, I will let, and I've invited all of them to come to the meeting today uh, to introduce themselves and, and stay and witness the rest of the meeting. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over um, to our students who will introduce themselves. And again, on behalf of the board and community, congratulations, and we look forward to working with you guys for the entire year. Maggie? Hi, I'm Maggie Murray, a junior at Bloomfield Hills High School, and I'm also involved in robotics. Hello, my name is Paul Salagi. I'm a rising senior at Bloomfield Hills High School. Um, this is my second year with the Board of Education and I was on the student advisory or board advisory committee last year. In school, I'm involved with um, Science Olympiad and Model UN. Hi, I am Thanks, Paul. Heather Chen. Um, I am uh, a incoming junior at Bloomfield Hills High School. And um, in school, I'm involved in student leadership and forensics. Outside of school, I uh, work with many climate organizations. Hi, everyone. My name is Lena Jindali, and I'm an incoming junior at BHHS. Just a little bit about myself. I'm a member of our high school's forensics team, as well as the Global Leadership Program. I'm very honored to be a member of the Advisory Council this year, and I'm looking forward to a wonderful year. Hi, my name is Adriana Calabat. I am a rising senior at International Academy. 
Um, inside of school, I'm involved in Helping Hands and our student leadership. And I'm also really excited to be a part of this council this year. And I know that we're gonna do great things and have so much fun working with the community. Hi, my name is Janaki Radha Krishnan. I am a rising junior at Bloomfield Hills High School. In school, I'm involved in Model UN Forensics and more recently, the Student Equity Council. Outside of school, I'm a part of various climate organizations and Detroit Area Youth Uniting Michigan. I'm looking forward to a great year with the school board. Hi, my name is Erin Williams and I am a rising junior at the International Academy. Currently, I'm involved in student leadership and peer core. Outside of school, I work and tutor at Kumon Math and Reading Center, and I am also looking forward to a fantastic year with you guys. Thank you. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you so much, and we look forward to working with you the entire year. I know I went out of order um, inadvertently. Um, so going back to, I guess, um, board business 3A, uh, can I get um, Kelly? Do you want to say some things before we make a motion? Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to share with you that the BHEA, our Bloomfield Hills Education Association Master Agreement, which expires June 30th, 2022, contains a provision requiring the parties to negotiate compensation for the 2021 and 2122 school year at the conclusion of the 1920 school year. Administration is recommending the board approve the tentative agreement reached through the collective bargaining process, the detail of which is attached to this agenda item. Highlights include a step increase for teachers not at the top step of their individual salary lanes and flexibility and development of the job expectations for teachers serving in the district virtual academy. The estimated cost of this agreement is roughly $1.5 million across all funds and wages for the 21-22 school year will be negotiated at a later date. The BHEA membership ratified this tentative agreement in an electronic vote held earlier this week. Um, Phil, do you want to you know, make a comment or a statement while you're here? Or you could you could uh, make a comment after we, we do the motion and vote. It's up to you. I see you in the in the grid view. Um, sure, yeah. Can I get a motion? Yeah. Sure. Uh, I'll make a comment after the motion and um, oh. the vote is taking place. I move that the agreement with the okay, thanks, Phil. I move that the agreement with the Bloomfield Hills Education Association, the VHEA, on, compensa on compensation for the 2020, 2021, and 2021 and 22 school years be approved as presented. Second. Okay, roll call, Jennifer. Oh, I'm sorry, discussion? Any discussion? Okay. Uh, Jennifer? Yes. Um, Howard? Yes. Jackie? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. I know Mark supports this. He just he apologized he couldn't be here. Um, Ami, yes, motion passes 6-0. Um, congratulations. Uh, thank you for all your hard work. Kelly, Phil, and everyone from uh, IBB Bargaining that were involved in the process. I know, Phil, if you want to say a few words. Yes, thank you, Paul. Um, you know, the, these, um, I just wanted to say thank you to the Board of Education for unanimously supporting our um, the wage reopener compensation package for next year. These deals are, are tough to uh, come by, but I think that we can always fall back on our strong relationships that the BHEA has with our administrative team um, and, uh, and, and rely on those to, to come to an agreement that works for all parties. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Well, again, thank you, Phil. I mean, I'm, I'm sure some of my colleagues made comments well, but thank you, Phil, um, for all the hard work you and your and your membership has done through probably one of the most difficult times I'm sure that you and your members have gone through. 
and we appreciate it. And, you know, as indicated, the board supports all the work that you guys do, and we appreciate that we can come to this agreement. Um, I don't know if any of my other colleagues want to make a few comments before we go on to talk about return to school. Okay, with that, I'm sure we're going to have a lot to talk about our return to school. So, Pat, I'll hand it over to you um, to talk about, uh, you and your team to talk about return to school. Great, thank you. Uh, David, if you want to queue up the presentation. I also want to thank all of our special guests that we have tonight. Um, we have tons of district administrators that have joined on to our great students who will we'll be working with hand in hand. We also have Shane Byes from the Oakland County Health Department. Uh, to help with some of the questions we know are going to come up a little later. And Ryan Beal, who is a therapist, runs Therapy.Live, and also is the author and creator of Prepare You, which we use in our school district, is here as well. So let me begin by saying this, this presentation is meant to give a high-level overview. Please understand that there are so many moving parts and details that are going to have to be worked out as we go along. We are going to have to create a plan that is more detailed than we've probably ever had to do as a school district before. Part of that reason is so much is unknown. Uh, is unknown. What we know today on July 9th is totally different than what we knew on March 13th, whether it's in regards to COVID-19, in regards to age groups, in regards to what school may or may not look like. But as we move forward and we give continuous updates, I think it's important to understand some of the baselines of where we're at and then what we think school is going to look like in the fall. So we're calling this Bloomfield's Blueprint, Returning to Teaching and Learning for the 2020-2021 school year. So we know as part of the governor's report, there are three phases. So David, you want to go to the next one? Phases one through three. If we are in phases one through three, and currently we are in phase four, we know there is no in-person instruction, it is remote only. And that is the case for every public, private, and charter school. No one is exempt. So if we're in that phase, we know we need to go to learning at home. As we talked about before, our continuous learning plan 2.0 last year was our emergency response to the pandemic. We looked at the surveys, we've interacted with parents and other community members, and we know that if we have to go to phase one through three again, some of the takeaways are we need more live or synchronous instruction. We need to have attendance taken so that accountability pieces put in. Access to materials and progress and grades. Keep in mind, if you're thinking, wow, that would have been great last year. Remember the governor's order where everyone, every student was to be held harmless. So we operated under that. Moving forward this year, if we return to remote learning, we're able to incorporate the progress in the grades. We'll have a revised daily schedule. Based on feedback from students, staff, and families, we have worked on updates over the summer to our at-home learning plan. So as a parent of a high school student myself, and I have older kids, and for those of you watching, the next question is, great. What does that look like? Walk me through a day in the life of my child if we're in phase one through three. We'll have that out and shared in August. Our goal that we'll have it done, our target area is mid-August, so that everyone understands that if we are in phase one through three, or if we return to school and the governor puts us back in phase one through three, you're able to share with your children. All right, Phil, governor put us back in phase three, is that home learning? Here's what it's gonna look like. I've had it on the fridge for two months, no questions about it. It's also important for our teachers. Right now, if I'm a teacher, I'm sitting and I'm watching, what is the expectation you have for me if we're in remote learning? How should I plan? How can I prepare? What is it going to look like on my end? That's all part of the collaborative process. One of the exciting things, there's many exciting things I've been able to do since I've been here, is to be able to work, whether it was with the teacher task force, or Phil and the union leadership to collaborate and make sure that everyone's on the same page and we move forward and we do it as a team. More now than ever, and I said this in a meeting we had Monday night, we have to work as a community. We have to work as a team. Sitting back and pointing fingers at people will accomplish nothing. 
We all want what we can't have. For me as a parent, I want my child to return to school next year in the fall like nothing happened, like COVID didn't exist. So she can enjoy her senior year the same way I did in the 80s and the way so many of you did watching. Knowing that's not a possibility is beyond frustrating. Even when we present our options tonight, many people will say, I don't want any of that. As a parent, I look at phase one through three. I hope we're not in a spot where we're in that situation. My children have all thrived in school in front of a highly qualified teacher who's great at what they do. So moving on, David, there are two options that we're presenting. One is all students in person teaching and learning five days a week. The next one is Bloomfield Virtual Online. So let's start with option number one, all students in person teaching and learning five days a week. David? So we need to look at what school is going to look like in phase four and five. We left phase six out. The reason or the why behind that is that in phase six, we're basically is the return to normal. There are no requirements, no recommendations other than the basic good old fashioned hygiene. Wash your hands, wash them properly. So let's take a look at what school will look like in a return under phase four. For those of you that have read the governor's recommendations, that is a big part of what we're going to cover. We wanna make sure that everyone watching or watching later has the same base of information to understand how we're operating so they understand where it's coming from. And this will explain some of the why. So in phase four, which again, is the current phase we're under, facial coverings must always be worn by staff except for meals. Facial coverings may be homemade or disposable level, face of grade surgical mask. Any staff member who cannot medically tolerate a facial covering must not wear one. Any staff member that is incapacitated or unable to remove the facial coverings without assistance must not wear one. So what does that mean? That would mean as a staff member, per the governor's order, you are required to wear a face mask. If you have a doctor's note saying you cannot wear one, you would not be required. Pre-K and five and special edu education teachers should consider wearing clear masks. I know that came up in one of the comments. I know Brian Gobi is already in the process of finding those clear face masks, not just for teachers that teach DHH, but for any teacher that may want a face mask that has a clear opening so that the student can actually see their lips and what they're saying. The other thing we're trying to trou troubleshoot is what do you do if it fogs up? So we're trying to, with the different contacts we have, come up with a plan. So if that is the face mask you want to use and it fogs up, here's a way to troubleshoot it so it doesn't happen. Homemade facial coverings must be washed daily. Disposable facial coverings must be disposed at the end of each day. So as far as having additional face coverings um, for staff members, our goal as a district is to provide two for every single staff member as far as the cloth one. If they would prefer a disposable one, we'll have those. And one of the great things that Brian Gobi and his team did is he made sure to order face masks that are individually wrapped. That takes away any questions about how many people have reached in there? How long has this been exposed out in the open? How was the bag secured? When you closed the plastic bag, did you trap potentially the COVID virus in that bag? And I have a list of probably 30 other questions that come to mind as to the why behind we're going with the individual wrap masks. Facial coverings must be worn by pre-K through 12 students and staff and bus drivers during school transportation. We'll get to transportation later in the presentation, but if you're getting on the bus as a student, you are required to wear a mask. If you're the bus driver, there is an exception to wearing a mask if you can't tolerate it or if it would interfere with the safe operating of the vehicle. Facial coverings must always be worn in the hallways and common areas by pre-K through 12 students in the building, except for during meals. Any student that is unable to medically tolerate a facial covering must not wear one. Again, the same as the staff. If there's a medical reason, you have a doctor's note, why you can't wear a face mask, that exception will be made. Again, if it's homemade, it needs to be washed. Uh, washed. Um, a couple things to note. 
with the governor's plans would go down. Facial coverings must be worn in the classroom by all students in grades six through 12. Any student, again, who cannot medically tolerate a covering must not wear one. All students in grades K through five must wear facial coverings unless students remain with their classes throughout the school day and do not come into close, uh, close contact with other students in the class. So our plan is to cohort K through five. So what does it look like if you're a K through five parent? If your child is on the bus, they need to wear a face mask. As they're walking into the building in preparation to go to their class, they would wear a face mask. Once they're physically in the room with a cohort of students that are going to be with them for the day, it will be up to that parent to determine whether or not they want their child to continue to wear the face mask during that time. A couple of the reasons like, why are we potentially not requiring it for all students in K through five? One, we want, we're able to control their movement in K through five. Think about what six through 12 looks like. If you're in a different math class, a different science class, you have passing time, all those things where you're mixing with kids from different groups. We're able to control that cohort, that elementary class, so that they stay with that group. The next question that comes to mind is, are they going down to specials or are specials coming to them? That's something we'll have an answer in August, and a couple of reasons for that. One, I know LST is working on a plan to restrict the movement of our special teachers. You can see already in public comments tonight, that is a huge concern. So LST is working on a way where we can keep them in one school for a longer period of time and have less movement, therefore making them have less contact with other students who potentially may or may not have come, uh, come into contact with COVID. For our K through five students, if they do travel to the lunchroom, they would need to wear a mask. If they travel to a special, they would need to wear a mask. Um, give you an example or another reason, and I'll get to Trustee Cook's question. Another reason or thing to keep in mind with K through five. Thank you, Mr. Colin. It is difficult for young students to keep a mask on for an extended period of time and keep focus. Just today, I was with Trustee Cook and a new family to our community, taking them on a tour. The mask, we probably spent an hour or an hour between two buildings. At the end, the youngest child was incredibly frustrated with having the mask on, and it was a distraction to him in a non-education setting. So that's some of the reason why. Continuing on with phase four, David, hygiene. What is required? It's required to have hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol. Brian Gobey and his team have a plan to have a hand sanitizer in every single classroom in the building and plenty of refills available. Also required by the governor's plan is to teach and reinforce hand washing with soap and water for at least 20 seconds and or the safe use of hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Talking about learning, I learned today that one of the biggest parts, whether you're washing your hands or you're using hand sanitizer, is the friction. When I wash my hands, I just kind of gently kind of graze over. After talking to the person today, I now realize that I need to really apply pressure and that the friction is really what breaks up what the, if you have bacteria or COVID-19 that is there. So we need to do a great job of educating. The governor's plan has strongly recommended items as well. These are items we strongly feel need to be part of our Bloomfield Hills plan. These are the only items we feel need to be part of the plan, but these are the items that we've had enough conversation to bring forward today that we feel need to be there. We need to educate staff and students on how to cough and sneeze into their elbows or to cover with a tissue. Whether it's a video for the elementary students that's kind of silly and out there that we have our students present, or it's the idea that a teacher teaches it in class, or it's a discussion with the high school seniors that has to be part of it. That used tissues need to be thrown in trash and hands washed immediately using proper hand hygiene techniques. That's another thing that needs to be taught. The other thing to keep in mind as we go through this, once we have the hygiene nailed down, this is what we're doing. We then need to create a visual, whether it's 10 by 20, eight by 10, whatever the size is going to be, 
the visual representation of all the hygiene and expectations that not go just that uh, go in the hallways of our buildings. They also need to go in every single classroom as a reference. So much of the hygiene piece that needs to happen needs to be educational. Systematically and frequently check and refill soap and hand sanitizers. Uh, Brian Gobi's already had conversations with EnviroClean about some of those expectations. I know you hear the comments, well, it wasn't filled. Our rotations of what we're going to do in buildings are going to have to change. Limit sharing of personal items and supplies, such as writing utensils. So we know, again, if I put on my parent hat of younger children, I need a school supply list. The sooner I can get a school supply list of what my child, if I decide my child's going to come back in person, if we're in phase four or five and not in phase one or three, I need to know what those supplies are going to be. So I know that, again, is something we're working on. We strongly recommend that we keep students' personal items separate and in individual label cubbies, containers, and lockers. Again, we don't want to, you know, stress students out. Don't touch that. Don't do that. But as much as possible, share or don't share the items you have. But if you do, again, a simple reminder, hey, make sure you wash your hands when you're done. We want to limit the use of the classroom material to small groups and disinfect between use or provide adequate supplies to assign for each individual student. So moving on to the next part of phase four, is spacing, movement, and access. Under the government or the governor's plan, there are no requirements. There are things that are strongly recommended. What we are recommending is to follow the American Academy of Pediatrics and the recommendations for spacing, movement, and access. And I quote, Desks should be placed three to six feet apart when feasible. If this reduces the amount of time children are present in school, harm may outweigh potential benefits." End quote. So Brian Gobi and his team has been going to the buildings to see what does it look like if we're at that three feet to six feet level. Depending on the building, it looks a little bit differently. In Lone Pine, there's some classrooms that are a little larger. We're able to get beyond that three feet barrier. I was with Mr. Gobi at Eastover like two days ago, and we set up classrooms there. Where we, were able, we were able to space them out at the three feet distance. And keep in mind, if you're a teacher watching this, that means some of the bookshelves and some of the other things you're used to having would need to come out of the room. Now, what if a class is a little bit larger and we need to move it out at the elementary level? We have media center spaces. I know Eastover, there's a computer lab. We're not sure we're going to be using that computer lab. And you think about having kids go from place to place may not be the best idea. The media center as we know it most likely has to change. You can't bring kids out into the space, have them work there and go back. The media specialist might be one of those positions where they come to the students, then opening up that large space as well. We also strongly recommend that family members or other guests are not allowed in the school building except for extenuating circumstances. They simply can't come in. If you have kids like I have who say, you know, the text comes, I forgot this, I don't have my lunch, I need this for practice, I forgot my notebook, the paper's worth 100 points, I'm going to fail if you don't bring it up to me. We'll have an answer for all those circumstances in August. We're working on the idea that we'll be able to allow people to come to the front of the building have a drop-off location that we can secure. They're able to, whether it's send an email, phone, again, working out the details and say, I need to drop this off for um, Ryan Beal. It's here. The staff member comes out. They have PPE on. They have gloves. and They're able to take care of it from there. Moving on from there, phase four. Required. Schools must cooperate with the local public health department regarding implementing protocols for screening students and staff. Now we're getting into the health part, the safety part. And we all as parents have the same questions. What is it going to look like? What's it going to feel like? Who's going to be in charge? How are people going to be accountable? In the governor's plan, it says Bloomfield Hill schools and all schools in the state of Michigan will work with their county health department for us, Oakland County, to, uh, to screen students and staff in accordance with the Oakland County health guidelines. Uh, we are very, very fortunate tonight to have Shane buys with us, who's a member of the Oakland County Health Department, 
Shane, if you could kind of just share what you're able to at this point, I would greatly appreciate it. Thanks, Pat. And I really appreciate the details that you shared uh, for the Bloomfield plan so far. Um, I'll touch on screening and uh, then we can move on to some of the other ones that might uh, uh, need to uh, talk about from a health department point of view. So before I get into it, I just wanna make sure that everyone understands kind of the frame of mind that uh, I operate under uh, when it comes to these kinds of recommendations or any kind of public health prevention efforts related to COVID-19. Uh, I talk about uh, layers of prevention and reducing risk as much as reasonably possible and putting in multiple layers of uh, safety nets, uh, whether that's screening, testing, contact tracing, social distancing, that the idea is that, so you don't have to shut down society completely, you're able to put these layers of prevention uh, on top of each other so you can reduce the risk as much as you possibly can and as close as you reasonably can to zero uh, and that's so we can have people go on with their daily lives uh, such as educating kids of which i have uh, three school-aged children right now and so i'm really happy to be part of this conversation so as it relates to screening as one of those layers of prevention uh, the governor's plan has some recommendations and talks about what that might look like um, uh, clearly, if, if you talk about screening any one individual person, whether that's taking their temperature, asking them, are you sick today? Did you travel? Did you do that? Obviously, for one person, for one kid, not that big of a deal. It's when you upscale that to an economy of size and you're talking about a high school with 1,500 kids, you obviously can get those um, uh, logistical uh, issues that come in quickly. And so the governor's plan really seems to recognize that. And so some of the recommendations and some of the things that we're working on here internally is coming up with some recommendations, for example, a, a policy and procedure template that schools can utilize and give to parents, where is that parent on a daily basis uh, would be screening and taking that child's temperature, uh, making sure that they're not, uh, make sure that they're feeling well uh, before they send them off to school and make sure that that is a policy or that's a procedure like many others that uh, we might have a parent uh, with a student at one of your schools, uh, you know, be attending. Uh, as far as staff go, uh, you know, that is one where the governor would really rather see some kind of daily on-site, uh, whether it's self-reporting or having uh, somebody uh, make a log, make a list. And that's what we do here at the health division. All employees that come in reporting once a day uh, to, to that front desk, it, we're keeping a log. And we're just this very simple check sheet as far as, are you feeling well? Yes. And uh, will that stop all infections? course, somebody may, may have an asymptomatic infection, but that mental process of stopping and pausing and just making it part of your daily routine uh, is what's important. Just like putting on that mask when you go into the grocery store, when I was first doing it, it felt awkward, it felt weird. But uh, once I started to do it, it was just like putting on my watch uh, when I go out the door every day. It just became second nature and it became part of the routine. And that's where as much as we can do to help those parents get that to be part of their maybe morning routine, getting that kid ready uh, for school, or when we have staff walking into the building, reporting it to somebody and exactly how that's gonna work and look like as far as building to building, school district to school district, uh, that's kind of where we're headed when it uh, comes to screening. Shane, um, thank you very much, Shane. Uh, appreciate you taking the time. Um, one of my colleagues, Cynthia, has a question specific for you. Cynthia? Yes, thank you, Shane. Um, I understand that Oakland Schools has worked together with Oakland County Commission to provide 60 nurses to schools in Oakland County. And I wondered if you know um, what their responsibilities are going to be, how they will be allocated. Cynthia, I really appreciate you bringing that up. I uh, Along with my analogy of layers of prevention, that was one of the other things that I wanted to start off the uh, 
conversation with. And those particular uh, nurses are going to be really important in the next few topics that we talk about when it comes to cooperating closely with the health division. So again, uh, the, the commissioners uh, have decided to utilize some of the CARES funding uh, that came down from the federal government. And we're going to be hiring upwards of uh, 68 nurses that are gonna work as close to full time as possible with the various school districts. And so the basic model is that uh, we are hiring them in, they will be Oakland County staff and they will be supported by Oakland County Health Division. And they will act in essence as an extension of the health division. And they will work with in your school district, they'll report to your school district, they will report to your school buildings, but they will be trained up uh, with any number of uh, COVID related uh, uh, knowledge. And I'm, I'm happy to report like right now, we're actively interviewing and making offers uh, to candidates and uh, we're doing really well as far as getting a number of candidates uh, to apply. And, and a lot of them are coming from hospitals where they treated COVID-19 patients. Some of them have school nursing background experience uh, for uh, some of their uh, background. And so, it's really encouraging to see so many that already have that knowledge. But uh, getting back to it, they're going to be an extension of the health division. So a lot of when we talk about communicating, coordinating closely with the health department, coordinating with those school nurses assigned to those school districts, um, you know, reporting to your buildings, reporting to your superintendents, your principals, and working closely with them uh, so that if we have to respond to a situation that if you have questions of principal superintendent uh, you can reach out to those school nurses and those school nurses even if they can't answer that question uh, even with all of our training and our orientation and our onboarding of them right away uh, the idea is that but i know who i can ask at the health department and get you in touch with so that way you don't have to cold call somebody or you don't, uh, you will know you a contact right away to say, we have this situation at this school, can you help us troubleshoot it? And that's the main idea behind what their roles are gonna be. And that's gonna vary from district to district. Uh, some might be more hands-on, some might be a little bit more on the planning uh, uh, purposes uh, for one school district to a next, and that's fine those are going to be decided uh, within the school districts. Uh, and we are there to provide this tool uh, to those school districts that they can plug in and fill gaps where they're needed for that. Thanks, Shane. We have uh, Jennifer, you have a question for Shane? Yeah, thank you so much for coming to our meeting, Shane. Um, part The infrastructure you're talking about at, with the health department and the nurses, it would be extremely helpful to have a, a systematic guideline for what to do when it is detected that a child has a fever or is ill during the school day. Um, so that would be a great thing to have like beforehand so that there is no in the moment type of type of troubleshooting. Um, so just to, you know, is that a reflex classroom? Is it a reflex contact tracing? Whatever the system should be. Um, it would we would welcome that kind of guidance. Pat, do you want to uh, uh, touch on that one as we move through some of the other items that are, uh, or are there any other questions that relates to screening right now? Yeah, I, I would like to touch on that one from Trustee Cook just real quick. That is part of the work we still have less, uh, left. So again, when I put on my parent hat, what if I think, and my teacher hat, so I'm a teacher, what if I think a kid's sick? So I was on a call with um, a group of superintendents throughout different states today. And one of the things they're doing, especially at the elementary level, they're having their teachers do a pre-screening talk with their kids every day. How many of you had a runny nose? How do you feel today? Did anyone feel sick this morning? Like, like a checklist of 10 really quick things. So we still need to drill down and put all those pieces together. If a student has a fever, if a student vomits, not only what's our protocol for dealing with it, what is our cleaning procedure? So again, I'm a parent or I'm a teacher. Mina's in class. She goes, oh, I think I have a fever. I need to go to the office. Are we taking everyone out of that room immediately in case it's contaminated? 
And if we are, where are they going? What space do we have? What if there's another class that's in that space? Then what do we do? Do we take them outside? Well, what if it's the winter? What's the backup space if it's the winter? There are so many moving. That's what I said earlier. We are going to have to have not just us, everyone, the most detailed back to school plan in the history of schools. Because no schools have had this many moving pieces. So as a former history teacher, you look back, well, there's you know, polio, or you look back to the 1918 pandemic. These type of plans, this type of detail didn't go into it. There's nothing we can pull and share. As we talk to even international schools about, you know, social distancing, most of them, they're at a meter. That is roughly three feet. That's what they've done internationally. So to me as a parent, I'm kind of frustrated that I can't have all the answers right now because I want to know. And we want to know our children are going to be safe or as safe as possible. And we don't know that right now. And I know it's really frustrating. And I'm frustrated too as a parent, as a superintendent, and just as a person because I want to provide as much information as possible so people can make educated decisions on what is best for their family. Is it best for your child to come back five days a week or is it best to do online learning? And we'll talk about that later because there's always concerns about that. I've had concerns about that as a parent and as a superintendent, as a teacher, as a building principal and all of that as well. Thanks, Pat. Um, I know Howard and Cynthia has quite two questions, um, both for Shane. Howard. Uh, thank you, uh, President Colin. Hello, Shane. My name is Howard Barron. I'm a treasurer of the school board. Um, I'll limit, I have a number of questions, but I'll limit this one just to the, um, to the tracking or the, uh, what you were talking about here, the, 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 the testing, the screening. Um, so it sounds like for the employees, we would have some sort of a manual system whereby they go to the front desk and check in or somehow fill in a, 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 a sheet that's on there, probably manual, possibly a spreadsheet or something like that. But for the students, uh, you said that this uh, screening would be done by the parent or the student, possibly if the high school or at home. Um, what sort of tracking process would you envision in, is that purely we tell them to do it and we trust them or do they enter it in some sort of system or how's that, how do you envision that working? The idea behind uh, uh, tracking and the logging, uh, really what that does is that forces somebody to say, hey, somebody might pull this, I need to do this, I need to take care of it, I can't forget uh, to track it, that kind of a thing. And so whether it's an electronic system, whether it's a parent, uh, you know, a sheet given to a parent at the beginning of the year, uh, maybe once a month it can be given to each student or something, and they it's a checkoff page or something uh, where they can check that uh yes uh, my my youngest is gray gray's doing well today i sent him to school uh you know september whatever um there's lots of flexibility that school districts have to do stuff like that the idea the underwriting thought process is that uh, you have parents to have uh somebody so that you don't have this bottleneck uh, at the front door to be doing that process and have some level of accountability. Now, again, I talk about layers of prevention. Any single layer of prevention by itself is not gonna catch everything. It's not gonna be perfect. And the idea is that they're not supposed to be, but they're all supposed to reinforce each other. And that's why screening, um, I like to bet that the majority of uh, parents that once you get them in a routine, they'll do it. And, uh, you know, some might not, but there's other things in place uh, uh, to kind of help out and catch those that might slip those crack, proverbial cracks, so to speak. And there might be technological uh, options out there available that I'm just not aware of right at this moment. Because that 
records by thought. And it sounds like you're thinking about just kind of a, a trust system that we give them the information and then maybe once a month or so we might do some sort of an audit. But technologically, I mean, we have uh, apps that we have for tracking of the students on the bus. And what I was thinking is that maybe there is some sort of a, a technological uh, solution or, or uh, process out there whereby the, the checking is done both temperature and health at home. It's entered into an app and then that's transmitted. And then uh, otherwise you're just gonna have 1,000, 1,500 kids all streaming into our high school and we don't know whether everyone has actually done their due diligence or not. Uh, we have a system that's being used right now in our athletic uh, uh, practices, but it's on a pretty limited scale. It's about 50 kids, you know, 25, 50 kids at a time, as opposed to a thousand a day over a period of like a half an hour or so when they're entering. So, so Mr. Barron, great question. That would be maybe that you could look with other districts if there is some sort of technological solution to this, which might be, give us a little bit more confidence that the parents or the, 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 the young adult who's got the responsibility is actually doing it. Agreed, Mike. Uh, you had a comment go before John, a question. Yeah. You can go to John real quick. John, if you could talk about the app you've been using with Qualtrics, the data you're receiving, and whether you feel it's something that is scalable that we can push out to a wider audience. I think that'd be really important for the community to hear how you leverage that. You're muted. There we go. It's my first time. Yeah, absolutely. I can definitely talk about the app and uh, the, the QR code process that we're using with athletics and how that kind of works. Um, we have the QR codes posted all over the stadium entrance. We do have a funneling in and funneling out of the, uh, of the stadium to ensure that there is social distance and that there is a flow on and off the stadium and into the uh, the practice facilities uh, in each day. Um, every day, the students uh, come in, they do the QR code screen. Uh, it's about four or five questions right in. And what they do, Shane, just like you had said, they do enter in their name, their email address. So they we do have a point of contact in the event that we have to contact them um, or uh, we, we look back at doing some kind of social tracing um, or contact tracing, sorry. Um, once the QR code is completed, uh, it's it's just simple yes or no's. It's the standard, uh, have you been in contact with a COVID individual? Uh, have you had a fever? Any of the symptoms, uh, yes or no? Uh, and once that is completed, it does give you a green screen. So I've always asked the students, hey, show me the green screen when they walk in. Um, it's a very simple, it's a bright green screen reads that they have been approved for entrance. And then we do a quick temperature screen. So uh, I have the, the touchless thermometer through athletics uh, and the temperature is read in under a second. Students that have gotten used to it very quickly, um, some of the smarter individuals have saved the, uh, the, the web address to their phone. They do it as they roll up, they walk in, they just show me the, uh, the green screen. Other ones will do it right in front of me. The process for an individual is probably less than 20 seconds. Uh, and it's fairly simple to keep the students rolling through the entrance of the stadium. Uh, it's been great because there have been times where there are more students than you think you'd be able to handle. But um, given that we're outside, we're, we've been pretty uh, confident that we haven't had any uh, infections. Um, and the students, like I said, have been doing a great job with adapting to that, using the QR code, asking the appropriate questions, and moving on uh, through the entrance. Part of that too is they are masked. So uh, we are pretty diligent with masking, informing our coaches, other staff that they have to wear masks when they are in our facility uh, and um, when they are uh, not participating, but when they are participating in athletics, they are able to take off their masks. Uh, John uh, and Shane, I have been using through, I'm a regular uh, blood donor and the uh, American Red Cross has for a number of years had rapid pass, which is the same type of thing where I answer like 50 questions at home. Now, all this is done at home. So not at the, not at the site, I do it offline at home in the morning. Answer all the questions, it gives me a QR code. Uh, the only concern that I have with what John just said is you know, if you flash the, the green screen, 
Well, that means you still have to be looking at things. It's possible also that people have their ID and then it feeds into a spreadsheet electronically once you've, uh, you've hit the, the go button so that someone at the front office can see all a thousand students and the spreadsheet can say exactly, well, you know, we've got 95%, but there's these 5% that haven't done their, their work or haven't done the, the entry. And those people can be flagged at the, at the entrance. So I think you can take both what John has and what the American Red Cross has and then merge it with a, a consolidation system and, uh, and our IT group and the IT group at, uh, um, whether it, at the health department or at uh, Oakland schools might be able to help to really expedite this whole process so that it's really slick by the time you get to the front door. Thanks, Howard. I know um, Cynthia and then Lisa has a question for Shane. Yes, thank you, Shane. Um, Shane, I'd just like to drill down a little bit more on the allocation of these nurses. Um, so I'm assuming that they are not only serving the 28 school districts of Oakland County, but they're also serving um, <laughs> parochial and, and charter schools as well? Uh, not necessarily. No, they're, they're focusing mostly on uh, the public schools uh, and the schools that uh, Oakland schools, uh, you know, supports on a regular basis. Uh, we're still, we're still finalizing a allocation a plan and um, there's a couple of superintendents that are giving input, you know, on that and some others. And we're trying to Look at a multiple variables, including like you know, uh, student population, that kind of thing. So that that's what what was my follow up. So what you don't know yet whether it's like one per district, depending on the size of the district, because there's such a very Yeah, off the off the top of my head, I think most districts are going to be getting um, anywhere from uh, one to three, uh, you know, nurses. And again, the idea is that. Uh, these nurses uh, that will be essentially, you know, temporary as far as the federal funding goes, which ends uh, at the end of December, will be working full time as much as possible. Now, in reality, when we are doing more interviews, what we're finding is that because they're still essentially part time status, uh, they wouldn't necessarily have benefits because that way we can get more staff. Um, many are still only able to maybe work two to four days a week, not necessarily the whole five days a week. So. It's a procedural thing for us. Uh, we would still have the funding for additional hours. And what we do is we might go back to the commissioners and say, could you add, create a couple, a few more positions so we can bring in more part-time staff to full up the hours. So whether it's uh, uh, two staff that are working essentially 40 hours a week, or you're getting four staff that are working essentially, you know, the same amount of hours, um, that's going to vary depending upon the school districts because uh, once we get them all hired, we're going to be plugging them into where they might fit best. Uh, we're going to try and keep them as closely as possible to their own communities. Uh, some of them have relationships pre-existing with school districts already, and they already have that familiarity with the community. So those are some of the things we're taking into consideration when we're going to be placing them with districts. So they'll be physically located within our district as they're working with us. Right. And so when I say we are giving them to you after we get them trained and they're basically extensions of the health division is that um, they're reporting to you. If you need them to go to a, a school A on a certain day to give some kind of training or, uh, or something, or you need them to do on this particular day, a presentation, a Zoom meeting, uh, you guys can do that. You guys kind of will have that decision making authority within your district, however that is regulated, delegated, uh, where they're going to be rotating to, what their schedules are going to be, uh, you know, in combination with their normal availability. Very good. That's very helpful. Thank you. Lisa. Hi, Shane. Thank you for coming. Um, what is Oakland County Health Department's recommendation if a student tests positive? Okay, so um, there's there was a few other uh, things that Pat may have been touched on if he kept going uh, down through the slides, and a couple of them talk about cooperation that are required elements with the health division, and specifically that's responding to positive tests among staff and students, and that's testing protocols for students and staff responding to positive cases, 
And, um, you know, uh, it's important to have as many details as possible in a plan uh, for the reasonable scenarios that might occur uh, on a regular basis. But there are so many, to be perfectly honest. Um, real quick, my background is in epidemiology. And I spent uh, the first 10 years of my career working as an epidemiologist here at Oakland County Health Division. And I've worked uh, any number of investigations from a case of meningitis in a preschool to uh, responding to a rabid pony at a uh, local farm uh, from 20 years ago. And so I have some experience in working with school districts. And the one thing that's taught me is every situation is different. Every situation has a slight variability. And so I am going to recommend that at a minimum, all the plans have language, uh, whether it's for a principal or for the superintendent or whoever is the responsible party to be in touch with those uh, public health nurses that are assigned to the school district and or our communicable disease unit. Uh, because what happens is there will be a phone call where um, a, a parent uh, uh, says that their daughter, their son, who was out for the last two days because of an illness, they just got the results back and was positive. Next thought is, what do we do? Who do we call? What are the next steps? And so there's going to be some basic guidance coming out that if you have somebody on the phone, this is the minimal information to try to collect uh, to help our investigators out to get the ball rolling as quickly as possible. And the next step is that once you get that information uh, or once you hang up the phone, either way, your next call should be to that nurse, to our CD unit, uh, and to say, hey, this is the information that I have. Here's what we know. What extra information do you need from us so we can help make some of these decisions? Because inevitably, the first piece of information that comes in is very often incomplete. I'm not going to say it's wrong, but it's incomplete uh, most of the time. I don't or, that. Uh, for example, somebody says, uh, hi, um, uh, my daughter uh, tested positive for COVID. Okay, maybe they did. The next questions are, what was the test? Was it a nasal swab that actually tested the genetic material? Was it an antibody? blood draw that might be uh, less reliable? Was the person sick? Was the person not sick? And so they might have tested positive with some tests, but to be perfectly honest, depending upon what the type of test was, uh, has a lot of influence over the investigation response uh, for the school and for our CD unit. And so that's just one example where the information might be incomplete initially. Um, and that's why it's important that as soon as possible, we get whether it's that public health nurse or the CD unit involved so we can start getting that more information so we can start taking action uh, as reasonably as quick uh, to respond. Right. So at what point um, do you recommend that we notify all parents of students that may have come in contact with the student that tested positive? Should it be right away? What if parents have to make plans um, because they have to keep their kids home? You, you could be talking an entire building depending on where that child was and where, you know, we, some of yep. our buildings eat in a common lunch room. So uh, I, for example, what, what, yep. what, when do we let parents know? Because if I, as a parent, um, I, I'm uncomfortable with any positive test, no matter how reliable it is or not. I would want to know. Right. And so, uh, and again, I, I, as a parent myself, and actually as a parent of three children in Bloomfield School District, um, I totally understand that. Uh, and that's something that we've had to balance in other investigations. And again, whether it's, you know, meningitis, rabies, or, uh, you know, or, or whatever, E. coli, 0157H7, whatever, the infectious disease has been, it's been a combination of, of getting that information, that actionable information, uh, and that's why I like to say actionable information into parents uh, as, as quickly as possible when we know it's reliable. And sometimes that just takes a verification with that physician, whoever the testing physician was, 
Uh, maybe it's a quick phone call with that parent to say, okay, give me a few more details now. Where were you? That kind of a thing. And that changes the messaging. Uh, sometimes you might uh, send out a message to parents to say uh, there was a, a, a small group of students and or a teacher, whatever the population is, who is definitely exposed. And you can say that they have been identified, they're being followed up with the health division. Uh, out of an abundance of caution and transparency, we wanted to be sure to share with you that this incident happened within the school. And give you an opportunity to make your own decisions if you feel that you know you wanted to take your children to get tested, what look watch them for um, additional symptoms or something like that. Basically, give that information as you're talking about to parents so that they can make education educated decisions with what to do with it next. So currently. How do you recommend that if you have a, an exposure to someone identified with a positive test, that you be tested immediately? That sort of jumps you in head of a wait list of people waiting to get tested in my, it, from what I checked today. So can all these people who have possible exposure get have access to immediate testing if they want it? And yes. how do they get it? Yeah, so it really depends upon, again, Every situation is different. Are we talking about 10 people? Are we talking about an elementary student? You're talking about maybe 100 people, let's say. How right, do right. they get tested? And also, at what point do you recommend, how many positive tests do you recommend before a school building and or district closes? Okay, so a few different questions there. So I'll just talk with like, as far as what testing options are available for adults and children. And what might that testing rollout process look like if there was an exposure, say, to a confirmed case? Uh, and this is why that initial investigation with uh, the CD unit, with those school public health nurses, are so important and why it's so important to get that ball rolling as quickly as possible. Because those closest people, those people who are most likely going to be exposed, have those close contacts, they talk about within six feet for at least 15 minutes. For some situations, that might be a classroom size of you know uh, 30 people. It might be bigger, might be smaller. And what would happen is with children, uh, there are options available. Um, pediatricians are more regularly coming online with that testing. And that might be something worthwhile to have parents check with their pediatrician. Do they have that capability to do testing? I know that a lot of urgent cares will test children under the age of 18, uh, usually same day um, or you know sooner right away. And there is also a federally qualified health center that we partner with, Honor. They have been doing a lot of testing in children under the age of 18 for us. If we're talking about adults, uh, there are an increasing number of testing options available, including the urgent cares and some things that we just laid out. But we also have our drive-through testing available uh, five days a week, uh, Pontiac Southfield, and now in Farmington Hills. And there's also many options such as at CVS pharmacies and some things like that for those kinds of testing options. And uh, so if people are not able to get a test through those normal means, uh, then that's something our investigational unit would work out with those particular uh, close contacts that we identify and we really believe are at risk of an exposure. So um, that's in general how that would happen. Again, every situation is different. So it's uh, very difficult for me to say, uh, you know, situation A, do this, 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 but that's in general how testing would go on. And I think you had um, uh, an additional question with uh, like how many, like at what point does a school need to close? At what point uh, should a school close? And, uh, you know, We've had conversations like that surrounding other things. We've had outbreaks of, uh, it's called norovirus. It's the gastrointestinal nausea, I mean, diarrhea bug that, you know, makes everybody really sick. And uh, in those situations, it's like, you know, when you can't really hold class, when there's not, when there's so many people out that you can't hold class uh, and hold it efi efficiently. This is different, of course. You don't want to wait until you get to that kind of a situation 
when you uh, have it. Um, it all comes down to is given that particular situation, do you believe that uh, the spread has been, for lack of a better word, contained? Um, if it is, for example, an exposure of uh, 10 people in, uh, and 10 students and a, an adult or something in a particular classroom and um, no one else is sick, none of them are sick and we're able to quarantine them and not have them come in or, and or get them tested uh, and they're all negative, then that's a situation where you wouldn't necessarily have to. I'm sorry, and I don't mean to cut you off, but that's contrary to every single thing that we know about this particular virus. It does. It, it's not like a norovirus or meningitis or anything else because it spreads so rapidly. If we wait a day and hope parents can find a CVS that can give them an immediate test for their child, I mean, we could be exposing 100, 100 more each day that we allow this to go on. And, and that's right, not right, the right, actually, I'm, I'm, another. All right, but one more question unrelated right, to that. Okay. Uh, so you said there's not a set number before you would recommend that a school closes. How does a county, how, how do we go from phase one to two to three to four? Who determines county by county what phase we're at? Is it by number of diagnosed cases? Is it by number of deaths? When do we get to, how do we go to from four, maybe we are back down at three? What's the determining yeah. factor? And, and if, if, if Pat doesn't answer that, I, I, I can, can answer that. Yeah, that's yeah. determined at the state level. Yeah, the governor is going to make that determination based on the quadrant we're in. So while we're in phase four now, you have parts of the UP that are in phase five. You know, conceivably, the UP could be in phase six in two months, and we could be in phase one. So a lot of that's going to be determined. At this time, I want to turn it over for a minute for Ryan Beal, um, who's here as well. He's one of the consultants we're working with. As we heard in public comment, um, we know that social emotional learning is important for our staff and for our students. So if Ryan just touch on that a little bit, but first also let me say that the stress that the pandemic is placed on everyone is real. There is not one person in this country who has not been affected in some way, shape or form, whether they've had it or not. So there's an incredible amount of stress that we're currently under. I think we see that on daily basis, whether you've been in stores or not, and you've witnessed people just going off on people inappropriately for the smallest things. It is a very stressful time. Uh, so, Mr. Beal, I'll turn it over to you to talk about social emotional learning. Mr. Rotten, thank you very much. Um, I'll do my best to add some value to this conversation. Uh, as you just stated, you know, everybody has been under a tremendous amount of stress. Uh, just hearing the work that you guys have on your plate, starting and reading the letter or seeing the letter that uh, Paul mentioned, you're sharing a lot of the concerns um, from teachers as well as families. You know, I was thinking about it this morning. You know, we've currently, we're about 17 weeks since our kids have been out of school. Uh, I have three young daughters. I say this because at this point, uh, I'm starting to see even the, we'll say the uh, psychosomatic symptoms or other symptoms coming out that, you know, we, we say children, behavior is a child's way or even an adult way of acting out what they don't know how to express in words. Uh, and so it's very important one that we're aware within ourselves how this change has affected us. I mean, in a typical school year, uh, the kids are off for summer for 10 weeks. And this is a time to charge and recharge connect with friends, maybe go to camp. Um, you know, kids have been pretty much indoors for the most part, finally getting out a little bit more in Michigan because uh, of the weather for 17 weeks. And by the time you get back to school, hopefully early fall, um, you're gonna be talking about 25 weeks that kids of all ages have had a complete disruption in their uh, social interaction. And that has the ability to really have a generational effect on them. Uh, to stick. And I say that for many reasons that, you know, I know that school is a focus of achievement. Uh, there's been more talks and you guys have been very proactive on the social emotional aspect as we're talking to. Um, and I think for everybody, as well as even adults, uh, it's important for us to be able to use this time and hopefully we get back to school 
uh, to connect, to reconnect with the kids uh, because they really are lacking that social interaction and we are too. Um, I think uh, I talked to somebody recently, they shared with me that uh, currently, and then those numbers are probably low, 50% of adults meet criteria for depressive disorder and an anxiety disorder today. Uh, that number is probably a lot higher. So that means that half of the parents out there potentially have been dealing with tremendous amounts of stress. The kids have been in the home dealing with this stress. And for kids to get out to reconnect with friends, their teachers, other trusted adults, uh, it is something that they need more than ever, more than an A on their class. And I know some students are going to need that A as well. However, uh, going back to school, it's important to kind of bring this normalization. As you know, Shane mentioned, about bringing awareness uh, and to the awareness of, hey, this is what we're gonna do every day, filling out the forms. It gives a greater sense of awareness to you know, what they're doing, whether it's putting on their mask or how people are around them. Uh, it's also important to do a check-in with everybody every day in the classroom uh, to kind of normalize the fact that we've all gone through this together uh, and kind of check in with everybody to make it kind of a normal sense of how's everybody holding up. Uh, I, it is. You know, as you know, and I'm not saying anything that we haven't all been experiencing, uh, the world has been pretty weird. Um, our kids have been watching the news, not understanding what is happening. They're seeing riots and protests. Parents are reacting. They're probably spewing out their political views, uh, the frustration. So, you know, it really is my hope for our kids' well-being that we are, even with this need for extra PPE and protection and safe measures um, that we are able to get to some level of getting back to reconnecting in the classroom. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, we're doing and we've been looking at with the Prepare You curriculum is, you know, we've been set with this 9th through 12th grade uh, component, we'll say. Uh, it's typically done the health classes you guys have been using. Uh, just so you guys know, we've been spending a lot of time looking at some of the classes that we can create a five class version for other grade levels because i know that was important prior to this uh, to help understand and have shared language between the students uh, as well as the teachers some of this is the irrational versus rational thoughts uh, one of the things that we've all been challenged with is we've had a, a ton of misinformation um, as well as a lot of moving pieces to understand and it's very hard to decide what is rational fear versus irrational fear versus utilizing these same skills that we would do in a normal day to day uh, to start giving this to younger kids as well as the teachers ways to interact and kind of help assess in their day to day how the things that are coming up for them are they things that we should be overly fearful and if we are fearful about it what can we do in the present moment to fix these or correct them so i say that because there's a lot of things that we can do um, without any mental health background or training to build a, a greater collaboration with the students uh, and, and within ourselves. So the other things that I think are very important is bringing self-care into the classroom, uh, making it a point that at least, you know, for class, hey, this is our five minutes for self-care. What do you guys want to do together? Uh, whether it's collective or individually. Really, I really believe strongly this sense of relationship and coming back is going to be more important than anything else that's going to be taught in schools right now. I know we have levels of achievement that we have to do, but this connection uh, and this re-engagement is the most important thing for the kids' well-being, as well as our own well-being, for a, a back to a sense of normalcy. Um, so I don't want to go and harp on too many things. I'm open to questions. I think that, as you see, uh, and as you know, different members have mentioned, there's a sense of hypervigilance, and that's that's needed. But at the same time, that we need to be able to take a step back because when we're overly worked up and hypervigilant, we sometimes forget to wash our hands. We forget to touch not touch that doorknob because we're overly worried. So it's important, as you guys mentioned, that this becomes part of the education, as well as that self-care and connection and helping each other get through this is also part of the education. And so as much as it's been done in the past, I think it's more important now than it ever has been by far. Thanks, Ryan. Pat, um, yeah, if you want to just go through the rest of your presentation for this, and then I'll hold all sure. questions to the end at this point. So, David, if we could pull up the next slide, please. 
<clears throat> we can go to the next one. Hold on, David. Can we go back? We should we're on the last one in phase four. Yep, leave it right there. So, Trustee Efros, you brought up some great questions. And that's part of our collaboration and the work that we're going to do with Oakland County and the Oakland County Health Department. What's really, really interesting is going to be what the CDC guidelines and they're working on an update what they come out with. But what we're required to do is to work with the Oakland County Health Department. And keep in mind, Shane's not just here as a representative from the Oakland County Health Department. He's here as a parent of three Bloomfield Hill School children that are in our district. So his level of concern, care, and wanting to get it right are just as high, if not higher than anyone else, because he knows his kids are here as well. So Shane, my question to you as a parent, what I would wanna know is, is there maybe a timeline or when will the work start, the collaboration, so that we can start putting these pieces in place so that we can again share it out. And I also think it's important for everyone to understand there might be a piece or two that is missed, a scenario we never thought would happen. Let me give you an example. I never thought there'd be another pandemic. Yes, you read about it, you knew it was possible, but I'm also a kid that grew up in the 70s and 80s who heard about the Cold War but didn't think it would happen. And when Rocky beat Yvonne Drago, that was the end of it. The Cold War was over in my mind. The movie Red Dawn was never going to happen, but it's happened. So if we do miss something or something comes up we didn't expect, Shane, is it fair to say we'll have the support of Oakland County Health for those what ifs? So my two questions are, is there a timeline or when do we know this work is going to start? Because like Trustee Efros is asking the question on behalf of the whole community. And you have the same questions as well. You have three children that are here, right? You you care as much as in Bloomfield Hills. They're going to the buildings. We're talking about working with the Oakland County Health. So if you could answer those two questions to the best of your ability, I would really appreciate it. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and I appreciate talking about like, you know, when will the work begin? And I, I think a lot of the work has already started, even if... Uh, some of those conversations might not be down to the district level. I know that Leanne Stafford, our health officer, has been uh, part of too many working groups to mention at the Oakland schools level. Uh, I know uh, Lisa McKay Kaizen within our office, is, you know, just uh, was part of a, a, a remote meeting with the school district uh, communication planners, um, and so a lot of those conversations are ongoing. And when it talks about like, when are we going to get some of those more um, uh, specific details for specific school districts, uh, I think that that's going to be coming very quickly. We are in the middle right now of interviewing those staff. We're hoping to have them trained up within this month and assigned to school districts as soon as possible, because perfectly frank, I, I wanted to have them, you know, uh, assigned back in June, but, you know, we didn't get the resolution passed until the end of June. Um, I, I know I want them in there coordinating and communicating with you all, you know, right now. And I also know that there's some draft materials we have as far as layouts that we're working through our office uh, as it, you know, relates to um, some of these if this happens, you do this, this is who you call. These are some of the more common scenarios. And um, I know our CD unit's working on that right now with Leanne and our medical director, Dr. Faust. Now, Paul, Pat, to your point, um, you can try to plan for all the potential scenarios, you know, that you can. And again, I've been in public health in one way or another for the last uh, 20 years um, and those first 10 years, every little situation was a little different. Every situation was, well, I never thought I'd see that one, but there's those basic principles, uh, public health principles that you then just apply to all those different types of scenarios. 
And we're not expecting schools necessarily to be part, to be those experts that be all end all experts. Um, but we are the experts and we, uh, I, I have, I'm close friends with a lot of our epidemiologists and our CD investigations and Leanne, our health officer, that when those schools get in to those situations that might be unexpected, um, there's as much support as we can give from uh, form letters that uh, we have that we can give uh, in those situations. So uh, our nurse on call line uh, that we have already received uh, 20 to 30,000 phone calls uh, related to COVID uh, since April that uh, those nurses staff during the day can be there as a support to parents that have questions. Uh, so you don't have to be, be the ones to answer those health related questions that you can focus on more of the educational activities. So it's not just the CD epi investigational support that can be given those specific scenarios, but it's more of those ongoing FQH, uh, you know, frequently asked question kind of scenarios and other supportive efforts and logistical supports that we can give to those school districts and those schools, depending upon that particular situation. Thank you. At your level, has there been any conversation about having one comprehensive plan that is for all Oakland County schools? A happens, you do this. B happens, you do this. So everyone's on the same page. Yeah, there, there has. And uh, those are some of the things that we're talking about is what do we want to have specifically in writing to meet some of those minimum requirements, those minimum recommendations? Uh, that could reasonably be applied to all school districts. And it, in what situations does it just entail? You just have to have that um, conversation on a case-by-case -case basis in some particular scenarios. And that's our goal is to get some of those things in place here so that long before doors open, end of August, beginning of September, um, that those things can be put in place. I do just want to say off the top of my head, uh, after listening to Pat's presentation and some of the things that are uh, already being decided and already getting worked on, uh, I talk about, you know, we have been having this conversation one way or another since April, since school closed down. What is it going to look like in the fall? And back then, the amount of questions that we have were even greater than what we have now. And... I think whether at the state level, the roadmap was very helpful. Um, and I think some of the things that Pat's already, you know, have his staff working on is kind of checking off those to-do lists and checking off those to-do items um, and just attacking them, you know, one at a time and getting them taken care of. And I, I just really want to, you know, uh, commend that uh, because um, it is a, work in progress because like Pat says, we're learning something new every day. And the CDC guidelines, when they come out new, we might have to revise things. But that's why we have these open lines of communication right now so that we're not forming these relationships when something happens. Thank you. David, if we can move on to food service. So Marianne's working on a food service plan that incorporates the best practices. I know one of the things she's looking at is providing grab and go for as many students as possible. And she won't be on until seven. Um, so there's some more questions. And she's also exploring the idea of allowing students to online pre-order so that meals can be pre-made and then delivered, whether it's to their classroom or things like that. I know, again, if I put on my parent hat, I want to know, are my kids eating in the classroom? At the elementary level, that is what we typically do. We'll keep up with that as well, or we'll keep continue to do that. We're also looking at the possibility of allowing students to go outside for lunch. Sixth grade through 12th grade, when it comes to lunch, we know that if they're going someplace, we need to make sure they're spaced out as much as possible. Those are plans that we're continuing to work on. Trustee Cook. Hey, Pat, if you can just go through the rest of the presentation. No, just so we'll just, we'll yeah. just have questions and comments at the end, Pat. Okay, moving on, athletics. Athletics. We're continuing with the policies that are already in place. There's guidance from the Michigan High School Athletic Association and the National Federation of State High School Associations. 
So if you've gone by the high school in the morning, you notice student athletes have been out there. John's talked about the screening process and using Qualtrics, using a QR code, and using technology to make sure that they're clear by showing the green screen on their phone. It also allows us to collect the data, how many days have they, they've been cleared to come in, how many days are they physically showing up, it helps with that as well. Another part of phase four is cleaning. So we've been working with ViroClean, which is our cleaning provider, on the three phase plan for cleaning in order to be prepared for all modes of operation. And that's not just for COVID-19 cleaning, where we'll include all the governor's recommendations as part of the cleaning, I'm sorry, We'll include her requirements as part of the cleaning, as part of our plan, but also what if there's staph infection? What if there's MRSA? All the different things that still could come up during the school year, that's part of their three-phase plan. Looking at transportation, what is it going to look like if I'm a parent when my student gets on the bus? What's required is that hand sanitizer has to be used before entering the bus. So on all of our buses, we will have hand, sanit hand sanitizer available for students getting on. Bus driver, staff, and all students in grades pre-K through 12, if medically feasible, they have to wear a face covering. But what if the child shows up and doesn't have a face covering? We'll have disposable ones that are individually wrapped that we can apply. My next thing is, what happens on the bus, you know, I'm a parent, if that kid's wearing their mask upside down, that kid's doing this with this mask. The other kid's going behind and pulling the string. You know, some of the things that young people may or may not do. Obviously, we have a code of conduct in place. I believe we have cameras on all, if not all, most of our buses. And part of that is the education piece. We need to make sure the students understand when you get on the bus, there's also a protocol. Another thing we're looking at is assigning seats to students on the bus. That way, if someone does get diagnosed with COVID-19, or they have the flu, or anything, when we look at contact tracing and working with Oakland Health Department, we'll know that Pat sits next to Paul on the bus. Behind Paul are Ryan and Lisa. To their left are John and Cynthia. To try to go back a day or two after and say, you know, Howard, who did you sit next to on the bus two days ago? And you're a kindergartner, a first grader. You're not going to know that information. Again, these are the detailed plans we're con you know, continuing to work on to have prepared uh, for August. As part of the requirement for transportation, we need to clean and disinfect transportation vehicles before and after every transit route. So we, we need to make sure we're kind of stacking our bus schedule based on our tiers to have enough time for the bus driver to do that between every single run. Now again, my, my parent hat on, what does that look like? What are you using to clean it? How are we making sure each part of the surface is being touched? How do we make sure it's not skipped? We know those are things that we need to include in part of our plan. But again, I'll repeat myself over and over. The amount of detail that's needed is incredible. This is the first time in the history of schools that we've had to put together a document that is this detailed in so many different facets. We need to clean, sanitize, and disinfect equipment, including items, car seats, wheelchairs, walkers, adaptive equipment being transfer, uh, transported to schools daily. We need to create a plan for getting students home safely if they are not allowed to board the vehicle. So what is our protocol if we show up, give you an example of what if that young person's getting on the bus, steps out, and vomits. Bus driver can't walk them home. Can't allow the student on the bus at that point. Call the parents, the parents aren't at home. This is the amount of what ifs we're talking about as district administrators, as cabinet, every single day. When you start to make in your own mind right now, as we walk through this presentation, you're probably close to two or 300 what ifs in your mind. And those are the things we're trying to answer going into mid-August. If a student becomes sick during the school day, they must not use group transportation to return home and must follow protocols outlined above. Weather permitting, keep doors and windows open when cleaning the vehicle. Weather permitting, consider keeping windows open while on the bus. So that is kind of where we're at with our transportation plan. But again, 
you can see additional information needs to be added. Next slide, phase four, the decision to close. So I know I've received a lot of parent emails about this. Pat, are you making the decision when to close? Are board members making the decision when to close? Is it based on how many people have tested positive for COVID-19? What if there's an elementary student that tests positive for COVID-19? Even though the bus is going to be complete, uh, going to be clean between each use, if middle school and high school students rode that bus later, do they have to be quarantined? And if they do, the buildings they attend, are they going to be closed? And if they are, for how many days? Right? We start to get in all these different scenarios of what if. The decision, the close, that is something we'll be working with the Oakland County Health Department on what's the practice or what the practice is going to be. Again, as parents, we want all the information. And we're doing our absolute best to drill down and get all that information and present it in a coherent manner so parents can make that ultimate decision. Do I want to have my child back in school face to face or do I want my child online during the day until there's a vaccine? We know more information. A lot, if we're honest with ourselves, between today and September 8th, our first day back to school, a lot is going to change. There might be things I said today that are going to be completely irrelevant two weeks from now, a month from now, six weeks from now. We have to continue to adapt as things come up. We spent all this time in our task force work. And I know some people are saying, I was on, I'm a parent, I was on the task force. We had all kinds of protocols we talked about could be put in place. Why aren't you talking about those tonight? Where are those? Why do we have that conversation? Those are things that might be in place. But again, looking at the direction from the governor, we are going to work with Oakland County Health. I would expect a lot of those best practices we came up with in our task force are going to reside in the plan that we make with the Oakland County Health Department. And if they're not, we do have the leeway to add something additional outside of that. It's, it's an old fashioned case of, you know, for some of this, hurry up and wait. David, moving on, phase five. We get to phase five, schools open for in-person instruction with minimal safety protocols. There is nothing required from the back to school plan from the governor. There are things that are still recommended. One thing that we feel strongly about, whether we're in phase four, five, or six, is the proper hygiene. We know the science shows that washing your hands is very beneficial, not, to, not just for COVID-19, but the spread of any disease, because we're always touching our face, touching our eyes, touching our nose. We can't say enough how important it is to wash our hands properly. Option two, David, Bloomfield Virtual. So it's free. K-12 virtual school it will open in the fall of 2020 for families desiring to have their children spend a semester or full school year learning from home. We're going to have classes that are taught by highly skilled, thoughtful and caring Bloomfield Hills schools teachers. So we had an option as a school district and I presented this in the LST. Option number one, we can go with a program that can simply be purchased by a third party vendor they can provide mentors that can check in with our students and do it fully online. It's, it's a plug and play system. It really doesn't match our curriculum, but it allows me tonight to have all kinds of answers for you. Here's the syllabus. Here's what it's going to look like. Here are the modules. Here's all of that. Simple, plug and play. LST did not have any interest in that because they felt it was a disservice to our families. They'd rather take the time to create a school from scratch, then go with something that's plug and play that wouldn't meet the needs or the expectations of our community. So I tip my hat to LST for stepping up and being willing to do that, including the teachers that are going to and are creating the curriculum that's going to take place. We want to make sure students maintain relationships with peers and teachers while learning fully from home. We are going to require parents to select 
one semester or remain in the virtual school for the full school year. Students and families will have complete access to class resources, progress, and grades. The same rigorous and engaging teaching and learning families expect from Bluefield Hills will take place. I know there's a question about extracurriculars. You can participate in any extracurriculars you want. I'll put on my parent hat. All right, Pat, I got a fifth grader. They're staying home. I just like having my home. He's great. He's a doll. He does whatever I say. It really works for us as a family. Can he be on the chess club? Could he do cross country? You know, can he be in the Cub Scouts? Can he do this? Can I still be part of the PTO? Can I attend all the functions? The answer is yes. So going on from there, David. There's one other part I wanna add. So I will do it verbally. So looking at the timeline, give me just one second. I wanna talk about what that timeline is going to look like, because I think that's important for parents to know as well. It's on the screen, Pat. Oh, is it? Yep. Oh, there we go. Sorry, we've been moving a lot of things around today. Thank you. So July 20th, the website, website will go live for information so that parents can start to see what it's going to look like. July 27th to the 31st, family pre-registration to help us get a sense of what our numbers are going to be for staffing. August 10th will be our family information night. August 11th to 18th, registration. This is where I need to thank all of our district administrators. If you've noticed the dates and you compare it to most other districts when you have to decide whether or not you're going to go online, our date pushed back to August 18th is anywhere from a month to three weeks longer than any other school district I've seen so far. So let me give you the why. The why is because we know information is changing. We want parents to make the decision based on the most up-to-date information they have. Here's why I need to tip my cap to the building administrators. It's going to be August 21st and they're roughly going to know how many students that are going to be in their building. They will then have three weeks to create a schedule that depending on the building, like the high school, could take three months to make. They are being asked to do a next to impossible task. The fact that they're willing to step up and say, you know what? I wanna make sure that our parents, our students have the utmost capability of making a great decision the most time available to make a great decision, and I'll do it, is, is unbelievable. It will be a mad dash to figure out what's going to happen. Now, when I put on my parent hat, first thing I say is, all right, Pat, I'm on the borderline. What's your recommendation? If we get to that August 11th to 18th, and you're not sure, my recommendation is to go online. If you're not sure, that is my recommendation. When I put on my parent hat, my next question is, it would really help me if I could know what teacher is teaching fourth grade online next year. Because if it's Miss So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so, that sounds great to me. I've always wanted that teacher. My older kids have that teacher. I would be with that teacher online, at the Nature Center, at Bowers, at the farm. It didn't matter. We're working on putting all of that information together. Again, I put on my parent hat. Next thing I want to know, walk me through a day. When is my kid getting up? How much is synchronous? How much is asynchronous? Am I keeping my whole teacher or the one teacher for the class? Yes, you are. I can answer that. We are working on that build out right now. We know for a lot of our families, that information is where they're going to make their decision, especially what that day is going to look like. And so we're working on that. And that is information that we'll have ready so that families have as much information as possible to make an educated decision. Next one, David. All right. Thank you, everyone, our community partners, volunteers, staff, students, medical experts, and everyone. This is a small step in what's going to be an incredibly long journey a sprint, if you will, to get to us, uh, get us back to school on September 8th. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'll start off um, 
and I know my colleagues have some questions. A couple of questions, I'll ask two or three right now. Um, one, which um, I know a lot of our community members are curious about. So, Pat, if you could talk about why, obviously, in your presentation, the recommendation is to go five days, why the hybrid method was not an option or is not being presented as a recommendation. I'm not saying it's not an option. Two, yeah. I guess it's two parts. Can I answer that parts. one first? Can I yeah, do one at yep, a time? Absolutely. Or I don't want to forget. Yep. So we did that three possible hybrid match, uh, three possible hybrid options. A couple things to keep in mind. One, a hybrid option is not an instructional model. It's simply an attendance model. And that was the purpose we were using it for. The second thing is it was overwhelming in our parent feedback on the survey that our parents preferred face to face. I believe there were 100, you saw my notes. I believe there were 139 or 149 comments that said, we want to go back to school full time. There was a minimal amount that said, we prefer the hybrid option over everything else. There are those parents and I understand why. The other thing we looked at is the possibility of or what's going on if we go to the hybrid model. So you've got, Paul, you're on an A day, I'm on a B day. So we're separated. But are we hanging out after school? Are we going to robotics together? Are we going to athletics together? Are we going to, you know, Starbucks together, right? We can't guarantee that that cohort, cohort model, if we go to hybrid, is not still mingling with other groups. We also look at the elementary level. You have three students that are elementary, Ryan, young, young girls, and the days they're not in school, they have to go to daycare. Now you're exposing to them people that may be from Troy, they might be from Commerce, they might be from West Bloomfield, they might be from Waterford, and then all the other people they've come into contact with as well. So that's why we made that decision or made that recommendation this evening. Question two. Okay. Question two. So you mentioned um, co-curriculars if people take if students take the online option, but there's some classes that kind of intertwine so I'll, I'll 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 go out for a, you know one of these critical classes like man and nature student leadership their classes but you know some way think as co-curriculars what about those things that may students may want to participate in that's considered a class but if they do online for safety reasons and, and they want to do some of those things how does that work out so i can't answer that specific question regarding those okay. classes but we'll have that answer in August. What I can tell you is if you're online, it is not going to be the same amount of offerings you could in the school. So if you're sitting at home as a parent, like, well, my kid wants to take two IB classes, two AP classes, this nature, student leadership, an independent study or something like that. We simply don't have the staff. We would need to double our staff. We would need the same amount of, high, those are high school classes, we would need the same amount of high school teachers that we have now teaching online to create the same type of offerings that we have now. It will be a pair, a pared down uh, list of offerings. Yeah, so we don't have that yeah, finalized could, at this point. Yeah, we could take those offline. Some of those classes, like man, and it's just uh, it's intertwined. It it looks like a co-curricular, but it's a mandatory class. But we don't need to go through that now. My other question is interesting in terms of mass K through five. Now we have obviously some of our middle schools. Um, are intertwined with six through eight and then four and five. So are we saying that six through in those buildings, six through eight will be wearing masks and then in the classroom and four through five will not. So our middle schools in essence will be split. That is exactly what I'm saying. The governor has mandated as part of the requirement six through 12 must wear a mask. Now remember, if you're a sixth grader, you might be traveling from social studies. Now I'm going to science. Now I'm going to my elective. Now I'm going to gym, right? You might be traveling. So what that travel pattern looks like, we need to continue to review. But remember, it's also a different cohort. You might be a seventh grader and you're in eighth grade math. Now you're going to eighth grade math class and you're in contact with all those other eighth graders who've been with all these other kids in other parts of the building. Our fourth and fifth graders are kind of partitioned off within our buildings. If they leave the hallway, if we decide that, okay, for PE today, we're going outside with our fifth grade class at East Hills. We need to walk through the halls. It is required that they wear a mask walking through the halls. Or, and, you know, and, sorry, and, go ahead. And, 
No, I get no, I, I, I get that. And so the answer is yes. So the, I guess the, the the fundamental question is, what was the decision? I, I know it's not mandatory. What was the decision to go with K through five without masks inside the classroom? What was the what was the, the, the decision to go that route? The big thing is we can kind of control that cohort. So if you have a fifth grader, let's say they ride the bus, they've got a mask on when they get in the bus. They have a mask on when they get in the hall. In the classroom, the mask is off. They're with that cohort of students all day. We can divide up the recess so they have an area to go and play in with just their classmates. They don't need to co-mingle with any other group of students in the building. We have that control with that group. Sixth grade through 12th grade, we can't do that, right? If you have a freshman at the high school, but they're in honors algebra two, you can't just say, well, the math teachers will rotate because then that math student who's a freshman of honors algebra two is with upperclassmen. They're with sophomores, juniors, or maybe seniors, right? Or you take this elective. We don't have that with our K through five. Also, the other part of our recommendation with that is just the feasibility of them wearing a mask for that period of time. Again, as a parent, you still would have an option, President Colin, to say, for my third grader, doesn't bother her one bit. She actually enjoys it. And as a family, that's what we're going to do. And you would 100% be able to do that and have your child still wear that mask. Okay, and then the final question is, I understand that you know decisions we made August 11th to the 18th. I understand if you choose online, that's fine. But if you choose in live person, and then after you know it starts September 9th, September 10th or 11th, or quickly you realize um, that you know maybe you anticipated it being a certain way, and you just feel that it's unsafe for your student. Is you know w will we have a possibility for those students to be able to go? What would be the cutoff, you know, out of, you know, like the college drop that, you know, where, you know, um, parents or families have the ability to put their student in the online academy once it starts and they actually see what's going on in the live person? That's my final question. So that's actually the same question Todd Bidlack posed to me as well, because he's really concerned about providing as many options as possible. So we'll have that answer before parents have to make that decision. Um, we're hoping to have a little flexibility that way where I'm in the building. I've been in the building for a week, Pat. Can't do it. She's got to come out. She's got to come out now. Where we really can't have the flexibility is I sign my child up for online. They really need to be there that semester or that school year. We're really trying to work on that semester as being, you know, a recommendation. And then if they want to come back to the building, they can at that point. But keep in mind, even when you're online, if you want to come in for extracurriculars, you are more than welcome to do that. So, mathnasium, anything like that, that's extracurricular, they could come in for. Yep, got it. Okay, so going back to the chat room, I know Howard had a question for um, Shane, and then Jennifer had a comment, and Cynthia has several questions. So, I'll go with that. Howard? Thank, thank you, President Coleman. Um, first, uh, compliments to Pat and all the cabinet and staff. This is an incredible amount of work and, and you really guys should be complimented. And I don't envy you over the next 30 days trying to fill in all the blanks that you've said have to be filled in um, between now and the middle of August. It's gonna be a Herculean job and, uh, and props to you guys. So thank you so much. Um, I'm really concerned about um, what Shane talked about with layers of protection. Um, and I have this question, I think, for both Shane and, and Ryan. Um, by the, the plan that we've got laid out, we are relying on masks and the social distancing is unfortunately being not sacrificed, but limited. And I grant you that there are uh, uh, different opinions coming out. There initially was six feet, now it's three to six feet from the Academy of, uh, of Pediatrics. But um, th this greatly concerns me that we don't, we're sort of, by having 400 kids in an elementary school, 600 in a middle school and a thousand or plus, depending upon how many go to um, uh, the virtual academy, uh, we're gonna still have a lot of people in each one of these buildings, both adults and students. So you talked about the, the hybrid model, it didn't work, and I grant you that. 
that the, the A, B, on, off type of thing is, is logistically doesn't work. But there is another type of hybrid that has been done internationally, certainly, and I'm not sure in the United States, which is the elementary and middles go full time in the buildings and the high school is virtual. And in that way, the elementary schools can use the high school building for expansion space. And we can take some of the middle schoolers and put them to the high school and some of the elementary schools and put them in the middles. And that way we get um, the, the social distancing that we all strive for, but still um, allowing parents to go back to work because uh, uh, high school students are able to maintain, are, are able to, to take care of themselves when they go home where an elementary school student obviously can't. So um, Shane, uh, has that been thought through in terms of what the pros and cons are from a public health standpoint of going to that type of hybrid? And I have heard though that there are social emotional impacts um, of students not having the physical contact or the, the, the in-building contact with their, with their adults and their peers. So Ryan, could you speak to, because uh, what we're gonna have to do is, we're gonna have to find, uh, there, there, either way it's bad. Either way, this is not the way we used to do it. But I'm really concerned about the, the physical health of the students. And I'm thinking that the, without the, the six feet of distance, um, we possibly are putting ourselves and our children and our families and our community at, at significant risk. So Shane, if you could talk about the, the physical aspect and then Ryan, if you can talk about the social emotional side of that. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, I, how are, you, are, you I, say, are you saying that, I, I just, hang on, I just wanna ask Howard, are you saying that our, our high school students from an equity point of view should be at a disadvantage and all be required to go online First middle school and elementary is that is that what you're suggesting, Howard? Yes, sir. And it's not a, it's not a it's not an equity standpoint, but it's a physical health. Our primary uh, uh, focus has to be on safety, 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 and health. And academics, unfortunately, at this point, I mean, I had. And, and why? Why? Anyway, that's my question, Paul. And, and why would you suggest high school students should? Okay. All right. High school I, I, I don't know that we can tap people with this. Lisa, how, this. How are they supposed to know this model? So, this doesn't seem like a good use of time to this me. It's an excellent use of time. So uh, my, my answer to you on equity is high school students can take care of themselves at home. Elementary schools cannot. So therefore, what we're trying to do, and other, uh, other countries have done this, where we, we uh, allow the high school students to be more self-sufficient at home. They don't have to be monitored. They don't need babysitters, but the elementary schools and the special education students do. So anyway, Shane, if you could just uh, talk to that, I'd really appreciate that. And, and Shane, if I could just cut you off a minute, Trustee Barron. Or well, maybe Pat, so you know, Pat. As part yeah. of our task force, we did investigate that model. And not only did we investigate it, we had a conference call with the school in Denmark that implemented that model. And, you know, equity is one thing, but the mental health toll it took, is taken on their kids by never being in person, never seeing their, you know, their teacher, not being with their peers. I'm not the mental health expert. I'll turn it over to Ryan for that. But I think it's important to note that we did that, that model. Um, we talked about elementary students not wearing masks. When we talked to the Ministry of Education in the country of Israel, the director of elementary education. She even shared that when it's hot, even though it's required for our students, they can't wear it. It's too much. We allow them to take it off on those days. And I also want to give Nick Russo a chance, Ryan and Shane, when you're done, to talk about instructionally at the elementary level. Sorry, Trustee Barron, I'm all over the place. So I'll go to Shane, then Ryan, then Nick Russo. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just uh, talk. Um, I just want to make sure that the concept of, uh, you know, relative safety, uh, we discuss that real brief. Um, I, I've had conversations with a lot of people. They sometimes ask me, if I do this, will I be safe? If I do that, will I be safe? And I can never guarantee that anybody is going to be safe. That's the unfortunate reality. Unless you stay in your home and you segregate yourself off from society, 
completely. There's really no way to be absolutely guaranteed safe. So whenever you're talking about a comparison of models, um, whether it's this one in particular or whether it's uh, social distancing versus mask wearing and which one is a uh, better prevention uh, kind of level, you're always talking about um, uh, comparing one model to another. And I said earlier in one of my comments, um, I talked about doing those prevention efforts uh, uh, it, you know, reasonably as much as you can for the other goals that you have, such as the education of students. And so, um, you know, wear a mask as much as you can. If there are certain things where that mask then infringes on other goals, such as uh, K through five, where um, you can control their movements more, uh, but then it becomes a hindrance to the education if they wear it during the classroom, that's where you have that uh, balance of uh, prevention versus, you know, uh, in coordination with the educational goals that need to be achieved as well. And so that is one of those things where in this situation, Pat talked about investigating that model during one of those uh, meetings and it's, okay, can we do this? But at, yeah, maybe, but at what cost? And is it worth it? for those costs. And um, that's the honest conversation that is worthwhile to have. And so I, I'll stop there and uh, and I'll turn it over to um, whoever's next in line. I guess the, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, and I, and I guess, you know, and I don't know, Pat, if you want to address, and I, and I know they discussed this in our instructional committee on one of the task force. The question that, trust, that Treasurer Barron was asking is, um, does it make sense to social, you know, to, uh, I guess you can increase your social distance at the risk of just saying that all of our high school students would go to an online platform. And and I, I think, I don't know, Pat, I know you guys addressed that. I know that came up early on. I don't know, Pat, you just want to comment on that. I know Jennifer I like and her, she's chair of one of our instructional committees. Jennifer, if you want to comment like on that. Ryan, that was my question initially from, from Shane and from Ryan. Thank you. Yeah, Howard, just to answer the question, and, you know, obviously it's important to look at different models. Uh, you know, my, obviously these are untreaded waters. Uh, you guys have done some research talking to uh, districts, maybe in different countries or around, around the world that have done this model. I don't know what the infrastructure in those regions are like, uh, and if that is kind of a material item that needs to be done just in order for some schooling to be facilitated. Uh, you know, my gut tells me that uh, unless it's a crisis mitigation because there's already an activated event or something in order to, we'll say, there's already an event at the high school where the kids are out of the high school and they have to be at home uh, because there is a outbreak, let's say, and it, you have the ability to maintain uh, the elementary middle schools by either utilizing the facilities as it is or utilizing even the high school once it's clean. Uh, for a brief period of time, I can understand that. On a mental health level, I think it would be detrimental. Uh, it would sacrifice, it'd be detrimental to imagine a bunch of 13, 14 to 17, 18 year olds at home for the greater good of the younger kids when we already know prior to this, uh, there's significant mental health issues and challenges going on prior. So I'd be very concerned to say that's a model worth doing unless everybody, unless we're ordered by the state to have another stay at home order, uh, it would be a model that I would, I would avoid at all costs unless it is a complete crisis mitigation approach. Because uh, I do think on a psychological effect, it's gonna be very traumatic. Um, you know, as some of the kids aren't gonna be as well at taking care of themselves as we'd like them to be uh, at these ages as well, nor is it uh, gonna be able to be controlled at what they're doing outside of school. Like uh, I thought it was interesting because I didn't understand the A and B or off classes. And as Pat mentioned, you can't control the cohort. They're still going to go meet up and go have, you know, a burger or whatnot. And so there's still a commingling. So you really can't isolate it anyway. So my, my thought and gut would say is that I would avoid it at all costs unless it's an absolute like crisis mitigation uh, approach. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks, Ryan. Jennifer, you had a comment? 
Uh, just just real quickly, because Howard, this was the task force I served on, and we discussed the model at length because we knew it had been implemented in Europe, um, and I don't know about other parts around the world. It, and I just wanted to say, in a perfect world, everything that you say is true, right? Older kids can manage themselves obviously better than younger, can do the tech better. What we learned though this spring is that the, these are our six through 12 population. They're not college students. They're not graduate students. They are young people. And it just, it, it, the online experience wasn't best for most of them. And so from an equity standpoint, from an academic standpoint, from a mental health standpoint, um, we did not think that parsing our student population in that way was, was going to work. And I, and I, Jennifer, I, I appreciate that. What I'm concerned is that we're gonna have some parents for kindergarten through sixth grade saying, I don't want, if you're not able to give me the social distancing, I'm gonna go to the virtual model. So therefore there is an equity issue, but you're kind of forcing the, the elementary parents to make these pretty no, difficult. No, but you're, Howard, you're forcing the six through 12 parents to give them exactly what they don't want, right? I, I, I under, it's a trade-off and I'm, there's- no, there is it, no it, It's not, you, you cannot part the community in that way. All right, I think, I, I don't want, so I don't, Actually, just to interrupt, I know Ryan, Ryan answered the question. I, I know, Jennifer, you had a different comment. I know in the chat room, did you want to make a different comment earlier on? You said you yeah, had I a just, comment when Pat was done. I know, I, I know we, we're going to a long meeting here, but I just wanted to say this is an impossible situation, right? We can't be together because there's a deadly virus. We can't be apart because we're human beings and we need to learn. Um, so I, I just wanted to say this for anyone here tonight or who might be out there that we really focus on being a community, giving each other grace. Um, Ryan, I really appreciated what you said about self-care. Um, I'm a medical professional. I, I spend what little free time I have reading scholarly papers about what the molecular basis of this disease is. And I, I have to tell you that for myself, a middle-aged scientist, my fear levels go all over the map, right? Even in, within the course of a day, this disease is a little bit different because it, for most diseases, a, a person would worry about, am I gonna get sick? Okay, with this disease, you're gonna spend, if you're, you know, most people, you're gonna spend an equal amount of time worried about whether you're gonna get sick and equally as important worrying about whether you're gonna get other people sick. And so you have a double psychological burden here. Um, and I think we really, really need to take this up. We, as a community, we are in the business now of biding our time until there's an effective vaccine. And it could be two months, it could be 18 months, N nobody knows. Well, what we know about this disease literally changes by the hour. So Howard, I appreciate your concern about three feet, six feet. I gotta tell you on a scientific basis, not, totally not, you know, in black and white, you know, how, what the effect is of being X number of inches apart, right? Um, I wanna thank Pat for talking about hand washing. It, it is huge and, and anything we can do to promote actual hand washing during the course of the school day, as well as the masks and hand, si hand sanitizer would be critical. You know, at, since I've been on the board, it was, this politics is new to me and it's a, it's a real education in not being able to please everybody on any given issue, right? And so this, everybody is so stressed at this point. Um, everybody's coming from a different circumstance, from a different health status and from a different level of fear, frankly. Whether, whether the fear is founded or unfounded, it's all valid, right? It's still fear. So I, I, would, I would implore the community that this is a time we have to pull together, work together, um, work through the frustrations of not getting exactly what we want from whatever school is gonna look like in 2021. Um, and I would also put a plea out to parents and students to please talk about this seriously. Um, you know, kids are kids and obviously they're gonna have fun, but 
every student owes it to themselves to learn, right? And every person owes it to themselves to minimize the risk of getting sick or getting other people sick. Um, so I would, I, it, it can't be, lit, and the teachers have expressed their concern. We, we, our teachers cannot be police people, right? They cannot, the, we, the, the students and the families really should put it on themselves to take the utmost responsibility in taking the steps that we know need to be taken to minimize risk. So, and I, I just want to, you know, put that plea out to the community and also put the plea out to the community to, to be kind and give each other's great, each other grace and, and recognize how much stress everybody is under, no matter how old you are, no matter what stage of your education you're in. Thank you. President thanks, Jen, Cole, thanks, Jennifer. Please. Before I know, Cynthia, yeah, um, I, I just want, I'm Cole. conscious. Um, Okay, yeah, and I just want to see, and and you know, af maybe after Nick, before Cynthia and Lisa have some questions, if Jackie and Mark, I know Mark joined um, early on, if they have some questions or comments, so um, maybe after Nick, um, Jackie and Mark can either um, have some questions or comments. Nick. Yeah, Nick, if we just hear from Nick and David real quick, because I want to make sure that Nick gives us the elementary perspective, and David Reed Norval wants to make sure we have the proper high school perspective. Hi everyone. Um, so from the from the K from, from our youngest learners instructionally, you know, it, to go back to um, not necessarily reasons for not having a a mask, but it's really important to know that for our youngest learners, um, for literacy in the area of literacy and for speech and language, it's really critical that uh, a teacher can actually visual visually see how what what the mouth is doing, what the tongue is doing. Um, and and it's a it's a huge help in, in creating literate students who, who are and especially in speech and language. Now, if a student has a mask, you know they can work around that. But um, the 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 ability to assess where students are in terms of phonemic awareness, in terms of actually making sounds and making words with their mouth, um, it's it, it's a it's a pivotal time in their life to so that the, you know in in creating these these paths in the brain and how to do that. So the teachers are kind of, you know, they're skilled at that. That's that's their bread and butter. And so not having a mask at those early years is pretty critical. If we put that against the fact that we are going to be hand washing as a as a best practice, as protocols throughout the day, um, you know, it, having five-year-olds and six-year-olds ripping masks off, sneezing in them, um, making jokes with them and playing around, it almost uh, goes against, to, to Shane's point, It's 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 about a matter of how much instructional time are you losing through all this, right? Are we able to make our goals and meet our goals uh, based on the parameters that, that we're setting for us? So that's all. Thank you. David Reed and Norval, if you can talk a little bit about high school and virtual. Yeah, so thank you, Pat. Um, one of the things as Nick just pointed out and is sometimes missed when, when we have conversations that even this one in four hours is kind of trying to capture the complexity of this is the full scale when you go kindergarten all the way through 12th grade of what you're really talking about. And as Nick pointed out, there's a lot of intricacies at each level that you really have to kind of think about. For instance, literacy. How do you do literacy training online at the elementary level? It's one heck of a question. No one said it can't be done, but when we came into this, one of the things that people are talking about is they're using the, they're using the spring as an example of online learning. That was crisis management. And how we get that to the whole community and help them understand is a question for us. But that was crisis management. Something came out of the blue and we did an incredible job, K through 12, and I really mean it was an incredible job to get us through to that, to that finish line. And the high school is a great example. We're the, one of the few districts that was able to figure out a way that our students got grades. Because as you start to shift in what you look like, what, what our high school students really need, they are one to two years out of college. Our current seniors who moved on to college, by the time COVID's dealt with, they're probably junior or seniors in college. So what does it mean to be someone who's a senior in college in the last four to five years? You're not sure if you really got the same level of education that your peers did around the world or maybe even around the country. And, and how do we say that they really did? 
that level of training is something that is also really important for our seniors. I never want to say a first to third graders literacy is less important than a senior's preparedness for college. I think they're equally important. And that's been the thing that you're going to hear the educators consistently say, the vision needs to be the same across all levels. It's about learning. Howard, you made an important point about looking at the needs of the students. But while people are saying, perhaps we don't need a babysitter, there's an interesting point about safety. Our high schools are actually more likely to be able to manage face-to-face -face instruction. They're more likely to self-manage. They're more likely to remember to wash their hands. And they're more likely to be able to manage how their mask works. So while they might be more able to handle themselves at home, they're actually more likely to handle this face-to-face -face situation. At the same time, we're saying that we need to figure that out for the elementary as well. So it becomes a really complex piece. And, and I'm on to just caution the whole group with assumptions. We, we often hear at the high school level the assumption that the high schoolers really can just figure this off on their own. And that, that's, that's not a true assumption. They can't figure this off on their own. If you take it about learning, can they get themselves up in the morning and brush their teeth and get through the day? Yeah, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about learning anatomy or AP calculus or, or really understanding the Iliad and the Odyssey. Th those are things that can't be done to the same level without a teacher in the same way that I would never expect a second grader to be able to read without a teacher really guiding them through the paces. And having a seminar discussion with a student when their face is covered is also incredibly difficult. We are really not sure how we're gonna do this face to face. So I just wanted to come, come on and say that we're really looking at learning as the mission. It's a common mission. What learning looks like at each level is, is where it gets really complex how we work that out, but that's where we really have to be. And I have to say the feedback from our high school families and our high school students has been feeling like the assumption is that they don't need as much care. And I wanna be really careful about that message. Our kids K through 12 need our top care for them. We need to really help them be prepared. And I'm incredibly worried about our juniors and seniors being competitive uh, as they move forward and being ready and also being, I think Ryan makes a great point. This has been tremendously difficult for them emotionally because they do understand what's going on. That's different. An eighth grader doesn't fully understand the abstractness, but our juniors and seniors do. When you're that young, but you're seeing a worldwide pandemic and everything else that's going on, it's really, really affecting our kids. We've had a lot of mental health needs and they just, I mean, we saw them at graduation, just seeing each other again was what that did for their health. And they're also an incredibly social group. So just wanted to point to those things. If as I think Jennifer, to your point, what I heard you trying to say is let's be careful with our assumptions and let's, let's make sure that our, our mission around learning is the thing that we're always doing and we're really working on that. Thank you, Pat. Thanks, Dave. Great point. Great point, Nick. Great point, Dave. Um, Jackie? Yeah, um, well, I've been serving on the um, steering committee of, for the task force for the return to school. And um, I just want to say that, um, just as Jennifer said, this is incredibly complex. And um, I think that, I mean, and as we had these discussions, it was all about learning and safety. Now, the other thing is, is that we're offering parental choice because there really isn't a perfect solution and it'll be up to the parents to decide um, whether they want to have their students in the uh, bloom from virtual or have them go back to the hybrid with the caveat that the only way we can even have a hybrid is if the governor says we should have that hybrid so we have to uh, always be within the confines of what the governor is telling us to do. And so as a parent myself, um, and my children are grown up and they came through the our district, I would say that the thing that I always um, relied on is that I know our educators and I know our educational leaders. Um, and I have always put my trust in, in them. And so um, I say that um, trusting our educational leaders to provide us with options and fielding this incredible um, complex landscape that we have to do right now 
is, is I think, premier. And the secondly is that because there are no perfect options, that's why we're giving the parents choice. Um, and it'll be up to the parents to uh, really look at the options and decide what's best for their child. Um, and the other thing is that, as Pat mentioned, the other thing that has to be designed, because this is really um, at the discretion of the governor and the safety of our state, we have to also be agile so that um, we have to be able to go to an all virtual platform at any time um, because uh, we know the way that the peaks and valleys are happening with COVID right now. That is um, entirely possible that uh, we could go back and forth between stay home orders um, or lessening those orders. So um, I, I just want to say by being there at the steering committee, I know the conversations that have been had. I know the research that has um, been completed and nothing has been taken lightly. Um, it's been very thorough um, and I trust our educators and our educational leaders, but and we have the best choices that that are possible um, during this really challenging time. Um, but it does come because there are no perfect choices. It is going to come down to parental choice. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, Cynthia, I know you had a couple of questions and then Lisa. Yes, thank you. I'll give you the simple ones, the quick ones first. Um, so I had heard uh, that the, one of the uh, recommendations out of the governor's office uh, earlier last week um, had to do with um, asking if school districts might consider moving some sports programs into the spring um, away from the fall. And I wondered if that was something that we had even looked at as yet. So that's so Cynthia, very if I can answer the yeah. first one, that decision is made by the Michigan High School Athletic Association. They're going to, I think it's July 26th or July 27th, roughly that area. They will have that decision made. It is not a local decision. Um, so we have, we can weigh in and give our uh, advice to Mr. Mark Yule, the director, but that is where that decision is going to be made. Okay, next one, um, buses. Um, so I, I, you can't do even three feet distancing on buses. So there's no partitions. So kids are going to all be together potentially for a long period of time. That's a concern to me. Agreed. And as part of the governor's plan, we all believe that's why she mandated that you have to wear a mask on the bus. Um, some parents are probably going to decide to give their children a ride to school or form carpools is what I'm hearing from a lot of the parents um, because of that situation with the bus. From an operational standpoint, we have a great concern with having enough bus drivers in the fall. So many of our bus drivers are in the high risk groups. We're anticipating they're not going or potentially not going to come back. And keep in mind, we also know that we have a shortage of bus drivers in best circumstances. I was on a call with a gentleman, Matt Dillon, who's the superintendent of Pedal School District in, the, uh, in Mississippi. And he believes he's going to have to shut school on some days when there's not enough bus drivers because kids can't get to school. And that's a concern I have for us. So the question is, what is our backup plan? At this point, we don't have a backup plan. And we not, we're not even sure the best way to go about getting additional drivers. Remember, we're one of the school districts in the state of Michigan that doesn't have a third party vendor transporting our kids. We have better pay, we have benefits, and we have a pension to offer. And we're still potentially going to be short of drivers. Thank you. Um, next easy question. Uh, virtual Academy, do we have a maximum limit of the number of students that can be at, e at K5, 6, 8, 9, 12? Todd? I'm not sure the answer of that. Todd, if you're on, do you happen to know where we're at? If not, I know that's something that we'll have an answer in August. So Cynthia. I can come back. I can come back to that one. 
Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have an answer for you. We do not have an answer right now. Oh, can you uh, hear me? Yes. Sorry, I had to hold, I, I, apparently I have two mute buttons and I had to undo both of them. Um, uh, so no, there, we're not expecting to have any type of cap on the students that choose the virtual uh, program. And, uh, but then of course, we're also not expecting that everyone will, will choose that course as well. Um, but it really just ends up being staffing and preparing for listening and for the board to know what's gonna be really important is we plan to do um, some, uh, in, you know, um, a little bit deeper surveying at the end of the month, because we're hoping that that will give us our first look at real numbers that we can use for enrollment projections. So we can kind of start figuring out how large each one of our schools are gonna be, as well as the virtual academy. And then from there, we have a timeline. I believe it was on one of those slides um, where uh, in early August, we'll do like a parent orientation meeting or an information event. And then we'll open up a registration period so that we can start populating those courses so that we can also handle staffing at the same time. So it becomes an issue where we have to take a look at where all of those sections are gonna fit so we can help our staff land in the spots uh, so we can build out the schedules for all of our schools, including the virtual program. So Todd, just on that, you know, just to follow up on that question. So will it be, I mean, what type, and maybe you don't know, what type of choices will students have in terms of the virtual online compared to what they would be getting in live? Well, we're still building those out, Paul, and I don't know entirely everything that's going to be on there, but I did put in what we have drafted so far in the weekly board report. Um, and I, so I think that's going to be sent to you this evening or maybe tomorrow. Uh, so of course, all core subject areas in there, it's gonna be a little bit tougher to think of a special schedule um, or an elective package for kindergarten through eighth grade, but we're gonna figure that out. And, and I think what we want to do is we want to do a, a very specific and special approach for kindergarten parents. So those kindergarten parents right now that are, that are sitting at home thinking, you know what, I might just opt out of this school year and do kindergarten next year because that's a choice. I would really discourage them from doing that. Even if they want to partner with us for their kindergarten year and still do kindergarten again next year in a physical building, we're gonna partner with them and look for opportunities where we can connect the nature center and the farm and create really uh, play experience um, uh, methodologies for them. So we're gonna put those things together. Now at the high school, because that's more, we have a more of a defined box there because we wanna make sure that the credits are gonna, are, are, uh, that kids are working towards their, high school graduation requirements. So that's gonna look like a little bit more of a mirror for our traditional high school. Uh, middle school might look like an alteration of that. And then elementary is probably gonna look really unique in, in that sense. But we're gonna make sure that the arts and those um, special academic areas are represented and become a, a real important piece of that virtual program. Thanks, Todd. Todd, that uh, weekly update was set up before this meeting, so we all have it. Great, Cynthia? Yeah, so I have two questions that sort of pick up on a uh, comment from a couple of the teachers at the beginning of tonight's meeting. Um, so one is regarding um, the facilities, the cleaning procedure for bathrooms, because bathrooms are a big issue in this pandemic. And I can tell you as a senior citizen who just drove interstate 900 miles, the stopping to use bathrooms is the most treacherous concern that you have. and worrying about student use and how many students are in the bathroom at a t in a high school bathroom at a time use between students uh, wearing a mask cleaning the fixtures in between i see that as a huge problem i'd be very concerned about it um my other teacher question um i, I was i was brought up and i think it's both for teachers and for parents um so in the course of the school year so you have um a, a teacher, a family member, somebody for whom a student um, is is living with, who has a colleague that the who has tested positive or gets COVID. Um, that teacher, that student may need to do, go into two week quarantine. That could happen to them even though they don't get sick, but they're living with the person or somebody who is immunocompromised child, grandparent, um, that could happen to somebody more than one time in the course of a semester. Um, I, how are we gonna cope with that? 
we could have many children out because of that or teachers out because of that. You're correct. We can end up with a teacher shortage where they're not sick, but someone in their home came into contact with someone COVID-19. That's all part. Again, I'm going to repeat kind of what I said earlier. We have to create a more detailed plan as a school than any time in the history of public education. And we expect to have not all, but the majority of those answers come August so parents can make that decision. You know, you're talking about cleaning the bathroom. Who's going to clean it? What solution are they going to use? Is that the best solution? What if someone's allergic to that solution? What if it's not the right solution? Read an article that a parent sent me today in the state of Minnesota, they've banned something to do some chemical in soap moving forward because of some additional, and I think President Colin, you're on that email as well, right? Do we have those soap bars in there? Our hand sanitizer has to be at the 62%, but then you read M Live in the news and you realize there's some hand sanitizer that's been recalled because of the wrong chemical components. Do we have any of that in our buildings? Brian and his team are trying to check that, not to mention the physical setup and things like that. You're alluding to the what ifs that are driving all of us crazy because we want to have as many answers as possible. And right now, as a parent of a student, two in college, one in high school, I have more questions than I have answers. And it makes it difficult to sleep at night. It makes it difficult to make a decision because as parents, what do we not want to do? We don't want to make a mistake. And when I first had a child, Someone told this to me and I didn't understand because you don't know what you don't know. Ignorance is bliss. They go, Pat, welcome to the world of having a child. I'm like, it's great. It's going to be awesome. Then after that, he said, you're going to understand in life, you're only as happy as your unhappiest child. I'm like, yep, whatever. This is when I thought I'd be sleeping through the night and stuff like that. And they're right, right? And so right now we all have a lot of anxious and unhappy children that we're going to have to make decisions for them as parents that they may not like, they may not want. And then we're going to explain this in their best interest. And that's going to cause friction again within our homes. We saw that when we talked to our kids about doing the work. My daughter's school district told her, hey, you can keep your grades from third marking period. You don't have to do anything for fourth marking period. You know, and my child attends, what is the fourth or fifth largest school district in the state of Michigan. So my conversation is, you need to do your work. Why, Dad? I get to keep all my grades. I'm fine. I'm off from March until September. This is good. And Jennifer alluded to it. Jackie's alluded to it. These are very, very difficult times. And if we don't stick together, communicate. And that also means, you know, giving critical feedback, you know, which, which is okay. You know, I had a conversation with someone today who gave me some really good critical feedback because they were trying to be helpful. They weren't trying to be hurtful. They were trying to make sure that we explore every possible opportunity as we move forward. And they had a lot of really, really good questions and came up with a great idea. They ended up at the last second with something we talked about tonight. So we still have to have those courageous conversations. We still have to share our, our, our ideas and realize it's not personal. But it's not what you say in life, it's how you say it. And I believe everyone deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. And as long as we do that as a group and as a community, we'll continue to make progress on our plans and what's happening. Cynthia, have any other questions before we go to Lisa? No. Okay. Lisa? Well, um, I, do, I just want to, before I ask a couple questions, I wanted to say uh, I've I read the 30, sorry, the 63 page roadmap put out by the governor. I've listened to and participated in a couple of meetings. Um, one really helpful one with um, representatives from school boards across the state of Michigan. And what I really like about the plan that we have is that it mirrors exactly what 
um, that what is in the roadmap. So it, it's incredibly vague and it puts the onus on every district to come up with their own plan. It gives us no funding to do this um, and there's no possible way uh, that we can effectively um, and we're a better funded district than most. There's just no way to do this with the amount of instruction, the amount of specifics that we've been given. Also, uh, I, I wanna make very clear, and Pat, you've alluded to and flat out said it a few times. We cannot promise parents that their kids are gonna be safe if they return to in learning school. We can't. We can't promise they're safe on the bus. Anybody um, who's got kids, <laughs> elementary school, which I assume is everyone watching here who has had kids at one time in elementary school knows keeping them apart by any amount of feet is absolutely impossible. I would never ask a teacher to do that in any circumstance because I as a parent could never do that. We have cannot um, honestly make any guarantees, not any. I don't care if we put sinks and sanitizer or every other foot there's no way to guarantee any safety. I, we can't say that enough. I'm uncomfortable leading anybody with the impression that we are providing a safe place for their, I mean, it's risky. So if for me as a parent, I'd like someone to tell me that so I know in advance the risks I'm taking and I can make an intelligent choice. Um, and I do appreciate that, that that's been answered honestly. Uh, do, do I think that we could be doing more? No, I don't think we have been given any instruction at all by the state because we have no money and we have no, we're getting no instruction and no idea how much money we're getting from the federal government. So this is really an impossible task. Spill into the fact that school is uh, childcare for, uh, I mean, the heartbreaking stories I'm hearing from other districts about parents who aren't choosing between classes and learning. It, it, learning is a luxury to a lot of parents in a lot of districts who are struggling, who have to get back to work and don't have choices like we do. So uh, it's a horrible situation. Um, but, but I like the fact that we're honest and I like the fact that we're mirroring what's said by the, in the roadmap by the governor. There's no way that we can possibly be more specific because there just aren't answers. I, I don't, um, I, I have reservations that come end of August, we're not gonna be able to do any of this, frankly. So uh, that's just my gut feeling. Um, it, it's looking, I, I'm incredibly skeptical that we can pull any of this off. For me, um, I'd love to see the online program bulked up and uh, what I saw, Briefly, thank you, Todd, for sharing with us. It, it doesn't look real equitable to me right now. I know we're really far from being done with it, but there has to be AP and IB classes in there. Um, I'm glancing at it. There's not a math class my kid could take. Uh, just not possible. So that's not an option for a lot of students. Um, Paul alluded to it in terms of some of the, the classes, but you're eliminating core classes. I, I think now is... Um, more than ever, and I've thought this for a long time, but maybe we seize the opportunity now to erase grades at the heading of every single one of these classes and let kids take the class at the level that, that's right for them, ignoring what grade level anything says on it, and hope that, um, you know, what we saw in the spring is if they're challenged and engaged, they're going to like it more, they're going to stay more engaged, and they're going to do better. I really believe the, that our students are smart enough that and that they're looking for engagement. They're not looking for an easy A. Um, I, I appreciate what a difficult situation everyone's in. It, it's not even difficult. It's impossible. It, it is. I mean, my, I, I could ask a million questions. I have a million questions down here, um, but, but it seems pointless right now or at this point to go into any of them. Uh, I, I also, as an aside, uh, I, I can't stomach the thought that we're making teachers go into situations that are unsafe. I, I cannot, I don't know what we do about that. I don't know if we expand more online opportunities and let teachers, you know, I, I don't know what to do, but it's not safe. And what we're asking them to do is 
I, I get it. It's all over the country. I know healthcare workers. I know uh, food service workers that go through it. And I hate it with every bit of it. I hate every bit of it. So uh, I just, I, I hope that, <laughs> that my own total bewilderment, confusion, uh, worry is coming across because it, it's, uh, no wonder you can't sleep, Pat. Sorry. Um, how can you? I mean, this is an impossible task, an impossible task. But thank you for at least attempting. And really, thank you for the honesty. Uh, things like that, things like notifying parents if somebody in the class tests positive, I don't care how reliable the test is or is not. I mean, that those steps help uh, parents know, I, I think me at home, if I'm deciding to send my kid or not, I want to know that I'm getting the right, honest answer to all this. And if the answer is we can't do it, we can't promise this, at least I know it was honest and then I trust. All right, that's all. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. I just so want to say- So I know just Lisa. before we, you know, finalize, Pat. maybe just go around and- Oh, sorry, Jackie. Paul. Yeah. Well, I just want to say I agree with Lisa on our educators, and I hope that we can look into um, uh, how we can best support our educators. You know, based on the uh, public comment. You know, uh, I'm sure we'll be look, reviewing that in the future. But I I agree with Lisa's comment on that. Thanks, Jackie. Um, Jennifer, and then I know David wanted to have some of his team. Jennifer, you had three points, yeah. three quick points. Yeah, just, uh, sorry, I forgot to say this before. So yeah, and everybody sort of touched on this and I'm sure David's gonna talk about it in a second. The choosing to be online or not for the high school cohort is gonna be heavily dependent on what they can take, right? And it may be a chicken and egg thing. Maybe you're looking for yeah. how many will be online before you know if you can pull a teacher to teach that class. but. The more specifics we can have on that, uh, the better. Um, also, just a couple of safety things. Pat, you said assigned seats on the bus. That is brilliant. It, it is really the bus that's keeping me up at night. Um, I like busing. My children take, my one child takes the bus. I love it. I need it. Um, everywhere we go right now, right, there's plexiglass between you and the person who's helping you at a store or whatnot. I'd like us to look into having a plexiglass barrier between the bus driver and the passengers. Um, I'd like us to, like you said before, carpools, I'd like us to look into asking fewer people to ride the bus. Um, and then for also expanding on what Jackie and Lisa said for our teachers, you know, looking at is, is plexiglass feasible um, for them as well. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Dave, some of your team members, I'm not sure who's on the call, who's on the uh, call that would like to go through and talk a little bit. Paul, are you talking about the high school level? Or were you talking about David Shelton? Yeah, you said, you, you made a comment. Um, um, you said at some point, Pat, can high school staff speak regarding learning right. options? Right, and then Pat made call. a comment to it unless you guys I mean as you've seen our work has been very much what everybody's alluded to if we're going to offer online how do you do that how, you know if one kid in one section of let's say you know an AP bio class wants online and none of the rest do what do we do um, if if a hundred kids want online what do we do so it's it's really complex there's a lot going on but that's been the work that we're really working on and as Pat pointed out, we want to make sure we have answers to these questions. And that might mean putting aside something that takes months to do, which is to build the Bloomfield master schedule. It's one of the most complex master schedules there is in, in, in the area. It takes months to build it. And somehow we're going to have to figure out how to do that in three weeks. And you're introducing a whole new variable. For instance, we have IB cohorts. AP cohorts, um, learning community cohorts. Now we're going to have online cohort. You're just you're introducing a whole new cohort concept into an already immensely complex schedule. 
So, uh, um, you know, these conversations matter and, and, and really making sure we've asked the right questions before we get there. Uh, and and it's, it's causing us to, I think, have to, I think like you were saying, Pat, seek as much expert counsel as we can before we actually start building something. Because in three weeks, if we're building the wrong thing, we're in trouble. If we got three weeks to go, we got to know exactly what we're going and then we're going full speed. I don't know if anybody else at the high school wants you know, to say something to it, but I think, I think our big piece that we've really been wanting to say is make sure that we are keeping learning as the mission for all our students. And I think, you know, with the high school students on this as well, I think their voice would be incredibly important in what it meant to be a high school student going through this. Uh, they, we have some kids who's, like we've said, Michigan, Michigan State, that's one of their three top choices. They, they've got a lot on their plate and they didn't want to just take the, the grade that was already there. They actually wanted to be pushed. They wanted the learning and it was a really difficult thing for them. But the other thing, I think somebody made a point earlier, it was incredible when they, when they just saw each other, uh, they just needed to be together. They just needed to see their teacher. And so there's an emotional toll on our students K through 12 that has also been really hard um, to, to work through. And, you know, it feels impossible, I, I think, some of the parts may not be possible, but we're going to figure it out. We're going to figure out something. And what we do figure out is going to be better than what the spring was. The fall is going to be better. We've, and we have to be able to promise that we're going to be better. It may not be perfect, but it's going to be better. And we are holding ourselves and the teachers are holding themselves to a high standard for what the learning looks like. We, we none of us felt like the spring was the optimal learning and the kids were incredible. The parents were incredible. But we're, we also know we can't relive that. We, we have to have some things in place. So what we do in the fall is at least moving us forward. Because in the end, our promise to these kids is they're going to learn and they're going to be cared about and they're going to be supported K through 12. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, and, and Dave, you brought up a point and, and just, you know, just to let you know, the seven students that, you know, it seemed like eons ago, but when we first introduced that are the council and the board interns, um, you know, they're working right now off a Google document, not just within the seven of them to try to get, you know, what, what are those questions from what they're hearing tonight um, that students across, you know, all levels, not just the high school, middle school, um, what are their concerns? And, you know, separately, you know, we're, we're going to arrange a call to go through, you know, what are the student concerns? Because they're, they're the ones who are, you know, obviously are going to be the recipients of a lot of this, but the, um, it's a great point. So, and they're doing it. I mean, a lot of them are still on this call who we introduced a couple hours ago, um, and, and they're going to be working on a document like that. With that, um, so what I want to do now, so I don't see any more questions or comments, and I think um, you know, there'll be a lot of stuff that we still need to clarify, but, you know, I'll, I'll start off and then go around with my colleagues, um, again, to thank, you know, every, everyone involved. I know I was on a call earlier this week that went, you know, close to three hours, um, going through all of this. So, um, um, a lot of my questions, you know, I, I speak with Pat Daly, a lot of my questions, um, have been answered regarding this. So, Obviously, as, as some of my colleagues indicated, safety for our staff, our teachers across the district is a you know, number one concern. But you know, I, I support the recommendation to move forward, um, you know, Pat, that you and your team put together. Um, with that, I just want to get a sense from our colleagues, you know, and I'll, I'll, go, I'll go to Jennifer next. Um, yes, I, I support the plans as they are presented. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, I, I, I support our team continuing to move forward and creating the plans. I, I have to admit, I was pretty stunned with the governor's uh, lack of uh, more specificity and um, going to three to six feet was pretty stunning to me. And, um, and five day school was pretty stunning to me. Um, and so I'm still wrapping my head around it, but. I am. Um, I understand the logic to it, um, and the need to, to move in that way. As long as we know how flexible we need to be able to be going forward, and um, need to give ourselves grace, but we need to help our families understand some of these questions as you develop the answers. Um, I, I too read all the survey responses and saw how 
how com complex the responses were in terms of all the different kinds of plans that we were, were asking. And so I understand it's not, there is no right answer that we all love. Um, we just have to try to do the best for our, our children and for our families and our community. So thank you. I'll, I'll support Thanks, you. Cynthia. Thank you. Mark? Uh, thank you for all the time and effort you guys have put into this. I support everything that you guys are doing. And I know you're giving your best efforts on everything you're doing, despite all of the uncertainty. Um, thank you, Mark. Jackie? Uh, I also support uh, the plan and, and the team that is moving forward to navigate this. I'm sure there's going to still be more changes, um, but I support the work. Thanks, Jackie. Howard? As I said earlier, um, Pat and his team have done an incredible job, and the next month we'll do even more. I trust you 100%. You guys are doing a wonderful job, and I 1,000% support this plan. Thank you. Thanks, Howard. Lisa? Um, I support the plan and am very grateful for everybody, um, <clears throat> Pat and administrators who have, um, you know, who have stuck with it. Uh, I just want to echo again what Cynthia said. Um, I'm really kind of stunned with the lack of direction and lack of resources that the districts have been provided with and th that you've done what you can with it is um, really admirable. I know that we're all on the same page. We're all really worried about um, our own and all of our st collective students throughout Michigan, throughout the country. Uh, it's just a terrible position to be in, but um, as long as we're honest with people and as long as we, uh, you know, are, are forthright with the information that we provide and as best we can. Um, but in terms of the plan, yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Pat. Thanks to you and, and uh, your whole team. I know you've spent and will be spending a significant amount of time between now and September um, or, you know, getting through this. And I'm sure we'll have other discussions. Um, I don't know, Pat, if you want to have a final comment before we go to uh, the final thing on the agenda um, before public comment is the bond update. I don't know if you want to make a final comment regarding the back to school plan, but otherwise we can just go straight to the bond update. Well, I'd like to thank Shane and Ryan for coming on and giving up their time free of charge tonight. Yep. Your, your information yep. was Thank critical. You. Ryan, you know I'll be calling on you for advice for SEL. Um, Ryan and I, some of you may or may not know, we go back 23, 24 years together. And then Shane, I'm hoping you and I can become really good friends. Uh, I didn't realize you were a parent in the community at first. Please, if we could use your expertise as we go through this plan, um, we're willing to share all of our documents with you. And if you see their pitfalls, please say, you know what, Pat, that's not a good idea. That's not going to work. This would be better. That's that, you know, criticality that is not personal that makes us all better. Uh, so Shane, is it possible we can kind of volunteer you on the spot for a little help? <laughs> Yeah, Pat, I'm happy to help where I can, and whether it's me or whether it's some of the people on my team, uh, definitely uh, happy to help uh, vet some of those. Sorry for putting you on the spot, but your background, your degrees, and then your parent in the district. Uh, yeah, so thank you for your, your time tonight. We are going to talk about the bond with Shane. I know you're in favor of and voting yes for your three children. Yes, I just put words <laughs> in your mouth as well. <laughs> um, and I can legally advocate for it. So thank you for your time, you too, and I look forward to Shane, getting to know you better and hear what we're doing well in Bloomfield and then hearing areas that you feel we need to improve as a parent, because as an organization, we're either going to continue to get better or we're going to get worse. And that's on a daily basis. By you having three children at three different grade levels, yes, I did look it up as soon as you said that. Second grade, fourth grade, and sixth grade. For us to know where we can improve makes it better for all the children. So please give us that critical feedback. Thank you. Uh, President Cohen. Yes, thanks again. Thank you very much for joining. Um, and with that, um, you know, we'll move on. And then Pat, if you want to give a, 
Uh, just a kind of a quick update of kind of where we are with the uh, August 4th bond. And again, if any of my colleagues have any questions or comments, just indicate in the chat room. So just a couple quick updates with the bond. Uh, one, the Facebook live events, they've gone really, really well. Um, as someone who doesn't have Facebook, and I know that's going to be shocking for a lot of people, I do LinkedIn and Twitter, I never <laughs> had Facebook. Um, <laughs> had a MySpace page, but that's a different time, a different place. I don't really want to talk about that. We were all younger, <laughs> so we'll leave that one alone. I kind of feel like I'm Phil Donahue, and you know, I get to have a guest on, an interview. I really like it, and I think it's a great way to get the message out. We have two more left, one July 22nd, and the other one's July 30th. Um, so please tune in, watch it, share it, ask questions. And then there's two items I want to talk about. Um, because the bond is so complicated, sometimes we're not as clear as we need to be. So there seems to be a couple areas of potential confusion. I want to make sure we're all on the same page. One, realignment of attendance areas. I think it's important for everyone to know that whether or not the bond proposal passes or fails, we will have to review our realignment of attendance areas, period. Our goal while we do that is to do with as little disruption to families as possible. So what's going to happen? In the fall of 2020, the committee, which is compromised of staff and district families, are going to convene to explore, to explore the ways in which the district can rebalance our attendance boundaries. So this committee will then present a proposal to the Board of Education in the fall of 2021. Yes, it is going to take a full year's work. So one of the questions I'm getting from parents is, Pat, what if we have to go remote next year? Are we still going to have the committee? We're having the committee regardless. Even if we're back face to face, we still need to do what Shane was talking about, mitigate contact as much as possible. So we will do this remotely, virtually. I mean, we talked about that today, that when everyone's back in booth, and we're having a cabinet meeting. We're going to still be on Google Hangouts or Zoom from our office, because what if, what if one of us does have COVID and we're all in the room together? We're all at home quarantining for 14 days. You know, our seven board members are going to be really busy at booth for those two weeks running everything. So, right, we want to mitigate things as much as possible. So going back to the realignment of attendance areas. So the committee will present a proposal to the Board of Education by the fall of 2021 for implementation of the fall of 2023. So these attendance boundary changes would only impact which individual school, the home, is you know, where you're scheduled to attend. So this is not a realignment of, oh, I'm in Bloomfield Hill School District right now, but if they change it, I might go to West Bloomfield or go to Troy. No, you're still a district resident. So again, whether the bond passes or fails, the committee convenes in fall of 2020, recommendation to the board, fall of 2021, with it to go into effect, fall of 2023. The other question I'm getting from quite a few parents, and again, these are great questions. And I am thankful that the community is so open to asking questions. A lot of times people can be nervous or not want to ask, is what happens if the bond fails? So let's talk about that from a financial perspective. If for some reason the bond doesn't pass, we would need to deplete our capital funds. We need to utilize our unrestricted center program reserve funds, and we would still fall significantly short to cover our needs. So what does that mean? That would force us to use general fund monies, the monies that go to directly educate our children. The next question parents have, well, what programs would be cut, right? Because people wanna know, well, if you're not cutting the programs I enjoy, then I'm not really worried about it. it doesn't really maybe it doesn't impact me as much. That's something we would need to decide together. So I am cautiously optimistic the bond's going to pass. So you might want to know why. I look at the timing and I know, and I've said this before, it's like having a child, there's no good time. I rewind to May and in May, there were 29 either school districts or ISDs going for a bond. All 29 passed because people felt even though in May, it's desperate times, it's critical, we need to invest our school, invest in our schools. I'll go back to March, because a lot of parents email me about Birmingham passing their bond saying, Pat, Birmingham passed their bond in March, but they're not paying more taxes. Why can't we get the same deal as Birmingham 
why are you kind of, you know, giving us the hard time saying we have to, you know, our taxes will go up. I think it's important to understand that the Birmingham bond was a renewal. They've already been paying those additional taxes year after year. We also know that the Pontiac School District passed a $147 million bond with 75% of the people saying yes in March of 2020. This is really a generational solution to what we have, to allow our schools to go back to that K through five, six through eight, nine through 12 cohorts, to right size our school districts to have two robust middle schools, to make sure we can keep the offerings we have and look to expand the offerings. We talked today and we heard President Colum from our special teachers about their concerns over traveling. And we shared that we're trying to find a solution where they travel, yes. Right size in the district helps solve a lot of those problems when we're K through five, six through eight, and nine through 12. There's never going to be the best time to do it. But each time we wait or longer it takes, the needs continue to mount up yet the amount we're asking isn't changing. I'll give you an example of the school district I'm in. A bomb was passed, this is years ago, to construct a third high school. A lawsuit was then filed. Almost two years down the road, it finally was approved, it was a close vote to build it. At that time, the decision was made, that high school can't have their own pool because we no longer have the money. That high school can't have the plan we had for the design because we no longer have the money. I don't want to see us get in that situation. Thank you. Any questions? I don't see anything in the chat. Yeah, um, Lisa, you have a question? Comment? Yeah. Sorry. Um, so the questions that I've been getting, Pat, what happens if it doesn't pass? So I, I know that you just talked or alluded to um, still redoing the catchments because that has to be done either way. I understand that. But what happens to the budget when we have to pay for repairs that weren't in the budget? This 33 million yep. spread over time. What, what do we give up to pay for those? So that's the specific detail I was talking about. People want to know what programs are we going to cut? We would need to look at that together. I can tell you, first of all, one thing, class sizes have to go up. That's the first thing. Yeah, That's I mean, I'm not looking right for specifics. I know you don't have those, but it's going to come from the general fund. I do know that. I mean, the repairs have to be made. These are critical identified repairs immediately needed, and we don't have the right. any like rainy day fund set aside. So are the it's without the specifics, and I know you don't know, and you don't need to, but um, just that it's coming out of a general fund and parents will feel it. These are th changes, um, cuts, like programs or larger class sizes, so teacher reduction. These are th the kinds of things we're looking at. Absolutely. But remember, I, I'm new. So coming in over here in January, when I had a chance to look at the offerings we had, I'm like, are you kidding me? Like everyone else has had to cut these over a decade ago. And then, you know, I shadowed at almost all the buildings. They have three that it's a COVID-19 on schedule I couldn't go to. And just seeing class sizes that didn't have 36 kids in a sixth grade class all crowded in together, you know, to see the teacher be able to interact with such smaller class sizes. Because what is it, 80, 85% of our budget is tied up in personnel. Um, and then, like you said, the catchments, the realignment, we need to right size the school district. That That's important. But we also want to do it with moving as few students as possible. That's why we're given a full year to do it. It literally could be done in two days. We could spend two days and say, here's where the numbers are. Here's the SEMCOG data. Here's what we think it's going to look like next year. Here's where you're going to go. That's not what anyone wants to do. These are very, very personal decisions. We select schools, our homes based on schools including elementary. And that's why it's a 2020 start date, a 2021 presentation, and to go into effect 2023. Okay, and one other question that came to me was, um, if we pass the bond, then we have to redo catchments. If we don't, we have to redo catchments. I, 
has nothing to do with Han. No, I remember way back when, though, Brian uh, telling us that by having some control over the size of the building and like some of our buildings are larger square footage, some have more classrooms and are smaller square footage just because of the way that they're configured. But by flexible spaces and by being able to design buildings that could expand or contract depending on some minor fluctuation in population that we would be able to keep kids who are currently in catchments, we would better be able to keep them in their same catchments. There'd be less ne necessity to move catchments if we could control the variables like size of the building and flexible spaces within the building. Am I wrong about that? I, I looked for the slide and I couldn't find it though. I would have to refer to Brian, but okay. in the meantime, I go back to what I said before, as little disruption to families as possible. We're literally going to have to go street by street, house by house, and decide what makes sense. This is going to be a long process. And as a parent, I would expect that. This is a serious thing we're talking about, but we need to remove it from the talk with the bond. This is work. In my opinion, as a new person, this work should have been done three or four years ago. You've got Bloomfield Hills Middle School that has significantly more students than when you look at like West Hills. And again, I talked about the traveling teachers. It is imperative that we get this right and do it as soon as possible. Thanks, Howard, you had a comment? Yes, um, uh, Pat was uh, so modest that he didn't give himself a shameless plug. Um, on Monday night uh, at the Bluefield Township uh, board meeting at seven o'clock in the evening, um, Pat will be giving a presentation on the uh, bond. So uh, that's a, please tune in to the Bluefield Township uh, website and it's on um, Comcast cable and you can watch that. And then right after that, uh, our director of the uh, Charles Bauer Farm, Alan Jaros, is going to be giving a presentation at that same meeting for uh, the opening of Bauer's Farm. So please tune in to um, the channel, the uh, Bluefield Township channel at seven o'clock on Monday night to see these two wonderful presentations. So Trustee Baron, just one little oh. thing. It most likely will not be me. It will most likely be someone else from the Speakers Bureau. I have okay. a virtual conference that starts Sunday, runs part of Monday and part of Tuesday, where I'm working with a cohort of superintendents throughout the United States on back to school planning and how we can be innovative. Also on that note, tomorrow afternoon from three to five, um, we have a consortium call that is run by Bloomfield Hill Schools yet again, where we're meeting with 14 different school districts only in the state of Michigan this time to talk about the governor's plan which also includes schools that are private schools so we can hear what they're thinking as well. So Pat, you might wanna to talk to uh, Supervisor Leo Savoy. Uh, right now, uh, your name is on the agenda. Yes, we are working on that. We've been working on that. Trustee Barron this afternoon, thank you. Thank, thank you very I'd much. I'd like to plug either way. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Howard. Okay, with that, um, thanks a lot, Pat, for the update. I don't see any more comments or questions in the chat room. Um, Dave or um, Corey, is there anyone who's joined for public comment? Uh, not uh, in person, but we have uh, four public comments written in. Okay, all right. If you put it up, I'll read it. Uh, Brett McKeon from BHHS and Conant. Uh, the comment is, have you thought about requiring face shields instead of face masks for K through five? I think they may be more likely to keep them on throughout the day. The biggest question is they are effective as masks because there is not much research on face shields yet. If not, will you offer classrooms for K through five where masks are required versus optional once students are in the classroom? The research shows that the virus spreads the most when masks are not worn effectively inside. I would be more comfortable if all students in my daughter's class wore masks. Then we have Gina uh, from Conant BHMS. Will parents be notified if our school has a positive case? 
Is there a threshold that has been decided upon? How many cases shut the school down? Uh, Gina also said, we um, comment was, we were sent out three hybrid options to rate. At what point will one of these be enacted? Will you choose one to start the school year or will you be planning on just going back full time? Full capacity five days a week for everyone with these precautions. And Mickey Rubenstein from Lone Pine, suppose a high school student tests COVID positive, confirmed case, and have siblings in the middle and elementary schools. Do these siblings' classrooms receive notice of exposure as well? How far reaching shall we expect the notification of possible exposure? Um, thank you. We will get back to everyone who issued a public comment. Uh, with that, I will call the uh, meeting to adjourn. Thank you, Pat, and your entire team, and everyone who joined. You know, for um, for this session, very informative. And this will be this has been taped and will be replayed. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.